greetings, class. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much for coming out. Um, I, I feel like everybody here is a personal friend of Kayla's. <laughs> I mean, it's all looking through, it's all friends from the last 25 years, and it's so beautiful to see. So yes, we are gathered here today to give our 2022 Canadian Trailblazer Award to filmmaker, author, historian, uh, a programmer, g g a board game designer, <laughs> location historian as well, uh, DVD producer, art the Blu-ray producer, I should say, archivist, historian of all trades, and so many other things, and also uh, an unofficial professor of musicology, I'd like to say, <laughs> the incredible Kayla Janice. Now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, shortly, I think it was a month or so after the very first edition of a film festival she was doing in Vancouver called the Cine Muerte Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And this is the festival where she programmed all the films, obviously wrote the program notes, picked up the guests at the airport, intro the films, tour tickets at the door. Mm -hmm. It was a full-on one-woman show uh, that was transformative for the genre scene in BC. Uh, she was also doing a really fun fanzine called Cannibal Culture at the time. Uh, so she, we emailed in advance, and then Chris Bavada introduced us via email, a uh, mutual friend. Um, and when she came in, we met in front of the Imperial, in, in front of the Imperial Cinema after a screening of Gamera 3. <laughs> and just proceeded to talk for, I think, like a 90 minutes straight in front of the theater. Well, like, a crowd was around us and waiting and waiting just to get in and talk. And then there were fewer, and then there were fewer, and then there were fewer. And we were just there continuing to talk. Because, you know, like the best cinephiles, time stands still when you discuss cinema with Kayla. And is in, in an electrifying way, obviously. <laughs> but, um, I'll make some prepared notes. But, um, I will say even then, I mean, she was an absolute, just bottle rocket of obscure film knowledge and enthusiasm that was so contagious. Uh, I always consider myself to be fairly encyclopedic about the stuff that I'm obsessed with, and Kayla showed me a whole new level. I was so impressed, uh, as was everybody. Uh, and it's just been a privilege to, to watch her grow over all these years of friendship. Uh, now, read a little bit from prepared notes. Uh, Kayla's a dear friend of 25 years, and I can't think of another author, filmmaker, programmer, historian, publisher, and everything else whose work has more consequently altered the ways the genre productions are written about, shown, and discussed. Her endeavors have bettered the scene in every way, re rescuing countless works from obscurity and inspiring a new generation of writers, programmers, and historians that we love. House of Psychotic Women is a culture-shifting book. Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched is a groundbreaking work of documentary filmmaking. Yet these landmark creations represent a mere splinter of the accomplishments of this extraordinary buckaroo bonsai of the genre <laughs> film world. <laughs> and now, before we get into the meat of today, we're going to present some videos from people who really wanted to be here but couldn't and sent this in their place. Johnny? <laughs> Love you. We wish we could so be happy. We are so happy. Genius. We deserve this game. We worked so hard for it. And just, we, we are so proud of you. And congratulations on this award at Fantasia. We're sorry we can't be there. Yeah. But we're there in spirit. And you're an amazing person and a great artist. And a very, very dear friend. Love you. Love you. Hey, Fantasia. I miss you guys so much. I wish I was there in person. I was actually introduced to Kayla and her book, House of Psychotic Women, at Fantasia 2016. She was there pitching at Frontiers for the book to be turned into a series. I made a note, I went home and I read the book right away, fell in love with it, and then when it became time to make my film The Stylist, I revisited it, I asked all of my cast and crew to read it. There's a whole section of the book dealing with the same theme of my film was. It introduced me to tons of films I had never seen, it helped me grow as a filmmaker. It's changed my life, honestly. And to know that the stylist has a little piece in the new edition of the book is like beyond something I could have never dreamed of coming true. 
I'm so proud of Kayla, so happy to know her. Congratulations. This could not go to a more deserving person. Hi, my name's Lars Nelson. I'm a film programmer. Been a film programmer for around 20 years, and that's coincidentally about as long as I've known Kayla Jeez. Um, I began working with her at Alamo Draft House in 2003, um, and I learned a whole lot from her. And you, when you work alongside someone, someone you really learn their values. Um, you learn what they pay attention to. You learn kind of sort of their tree of priorities. And with Kayla, I really learned that. Well, I already knew at a job that you have a responsibility to your employer. Uh, I knew as a film programmer that you have a responsibility to your audience. Um, what I didn't quite realize is that equal to those responsibilities, maybe even greater than those responsibilities, you have an obligation to the creators who made this stuff, who might not even be alive anymore, who might never ever even know you exist or know that you're screening their films, um, and also to the spirit that animated those people, to, to the entire sort of force of creation that came through other people that constituted part of what those creators were about. And that responsibility that you have to those creators and to that creative force is something that Kayla taught me and something that I've taught everyone that I have passed on whatever knowledge I have uh, to. So other programmers um, are getting this because programmers are coming through my program all the time and a lot of the people who are out there programming have come through this program and have learned from me and uh, conversely have um, learned from Kayla Janice. Thank you so much Kayla Janice for everything you've done for me and thank you Kayla Janice for everything you've done for all those creators who may or may not ever know our names or know we exist. Thank you. If anyone deserves a Trailblazer Award, it's you Kayla. You've dared to explore the darkest parts of your psyche with honesty like very few have the courage to do, and you've shown the light on films that are obscure for most of us, or certainly for me. Very few people care for the quality of their work or, as, or are as passionately relentless in doing justice to films as you. I'm so very proud of you. I so wish I was there in person to celebrate you tonight, and I love you so very much. Hello, this is Tim Lucas chiming in from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'd like to congratulate Kayla Janice on being a recipient of this year's Canadian Trailblazer Award. Canadian Trailblazer sounds about right. Kayla made an unforgettable entrance on the world stage with her book, House of Psychotic Women. In my opinion, the first book to take a personal look at the horror genre without just wallowing in nostalgia. Anyone who's ever tried to write autobiographically knows that it's not just a lot harder than it looks. It's about the most punishing thing any writer can undertake or dare to put out there. I know that she's often wished that she hadn't written it, so please give her an outpouring of love tonight, which she'll <laughs> never forget. In the years since, Kayla has become a key voice in our niche of popular culture, a fireball in the industry, horror school founder, a film programmer, video watchdog contributor, only once, but it counts, <laughs> an accomplished documentarian and a producer of the monolithic, overwhelming All Haunts Be Hours Blu-ray box set. All this, and the publisher, whose spectacular optical imprint seems to specialize only in must-have books. I'm very proud to have had some small involvement with this one and this one. Time is short, so I'm sending Kayla all my best on her big night. I hope we will all have a chance to meet in person someday. Until then, stay well, everyone, and once again, my congratulations to the lady of the hour. Congratulations to Kayla Denise on winning the Canadian Trailblazers Award. There is no one more deserving of this award, in my opinion. Here's a woman who has researched, worked so hard, written about, written books about, made movies about genre cinema, and has an in-depth knowledge and understanding of cinema. I think she's amazing. If you spend one hour with her and talk to her about cinema, your mind will be blown. So hopefully you'll all get to meet her and give her a big hug and tell her what a great person she is and an awesome addition to our community because that's it. She truly is. Congratulations, Kayla. So proud of you. Ladies and gentlemen,
win these awards here, and I always wondered how big and heavy they are, and I can now guarantee they are big and heavy. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming and being here, and it's very surreal to me, but okay, let's go. Let's <laughs> introduce Bill Ackerman, our moderator for this evening. I will just step back and enjoy. Take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I am Bill Ackerman. Uh, I host the Supporting Characters podcast. Uh, it's a podcast that focuses on people that have channeled their love of film uh, into some kind of project or vocation. I talk to writers, programmers, historians, uh, fellow podcasters, home video producers, filmmakers, and uh, I talk to video store people, fanzine publishers, uh, bootleg traders. A few people have uh, been in the, uh, on the show that are in this audience. Uh, legendary Caitlin McDonough is here. Um, but Caitlin, Caitlin Chase is really the ultimate guest for my show. Uh, she's somebody that the majority of guests, I think, have probably shouted out. Uh, everyone from Tim Lucas, Stephen Thrower, uh, to younger voices like Elizabeth Purcell, uh, Sam Deacon. Uh, it's not just because she's you know, the um, most prolific in terms of film cultural uh, accomplishments. And she's somebody that uh, you know, is an inspiration. I mean, she, uh, you know, and I think that she, uh, she might get the most attention for the writing she does and the, uh, the filmmaking now, but every aspect of, of her career is remarkable. Uh, I'm going to especially shout out uh, her podcast. <laughs> Uh, song from the Heart Beats the Devil Every Time. I'm going to mention it a few times today because it's great and not enough people talk about it. Uh, she's an inspirational figure. Uh, setting aside House of Psychotic Women, which has inspired filmmakers, writers, YouTube videos and channels, Instagram accounts, art exhibits, film programmers, a lot of letterbox lists. She's <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the best qualities of DIY culture, the do-it-yourself spirit. She shows it's possible to pursue an endless variety of interesting, successful, resonant work uh, without coming from money, without coming from a place of privilege. I think that's important to know. And she finds opportunities for others. She gives back to the film communities that have supported her. Uh, I can speak personally that she's helped me in a number of ways. Uh, she created, she's created film festivals. She's co-founded a micro cinema. She's founded an international school for horror studies. Uh, she's launched a small press, published some all amazing books. She created a podcast. She produced documentaries. She starred in documentaries. Uh, she's directed a great documentary. She did great work in home video, curating key Blu-ray box sets, contributing rich, interesting audio commentaries. Uh, she's responsible for getting Necromantic moved off the band list in British Columbia. She played the opening to Motley Crue's Home Sweet Home on the piano. <laughs> uh, she's the sort of person who can accidentally back into starting a fan scene or a film festival and follow through and make something great. Or watch a home feature, uh, you know, bonus feature she innocently suggested for Blood Satan's Claw evolve into an epic that is longer than Apocalypse Now. I need the version, read version of that. Uh, all of this is the result of her passion, her tenacity, and her perfectionism. And, and she wants to share the joy that she gets from her obsessions. It's not trying to get rich or show off her amazing knowledge. It's, it's to share to, uh, with others. I mean, you look at Sin Muerte, and the reason that even came into being was because Black Dog customers wanted to see the movies that she wrote about in cannibal culture, and she, she made it happen. Uh, you know, years ago, uh, I drove up to Toronto to find old film locations with her, and uh, she not only made a great map, and in 11 hours we found all these great places, but then she converted it into an event for others. She even had a whole book, uh, little bus tour at Horror Express <laughs> with guest appearances and a class of 1984 screening. And it was just because she had to share this one afternoon, but because she had that much fun that she wanted other people uh, to enjoy it too. Uh, you know, she's uh, you know, somebody that uh, is, is, is a dear friend, and I'm really proud of her. Uh, I, I just wanted to also just say that I don't know if people associate uh, darkness and heaviness with Kayla because of the heavy revelations of how psychotic women with the, the, uh, the thoughtful examination of folk horror. Uh, but she's brought so much fun to film culture. I mean, I, I think about the Saturday morning All You Can Eat Cereal uh, cartoon party, <laughs> shout out to Torn Atkinson, uh, Music Mondays, The Torture Garden. Uh, 
uh, Bloodshot's 48-hour filmmaking challenge. She made a genre-long board game. Who would do that? <laughs> you know, identikit scarves. You know, you know, what, you know if, whether watching Deep End in a pool or Until the Light Takes Us on Screen Made of Snow. She's given people so many great experiences that they're never going to forget. So, uh, you know, congratulations to the Canadian Trailblazing uh, Award winner. Wombat Vengeance. Um, well, any, has anybody seen Rock and Roll High School 2 Return to Ooh. Rock and Roll High School? So, I don't, I don't even know what, it was like, I did not like that movie very much, but I remember laughing my head off because they were, you know, there's like a band, they're trying to think of a band name at some point in the movie and somebody yells out, Wombat Vengeance! And they don't get, end up choosing that as their band name. But then years later, when I was like living in Vancouver, and there was like people in my... I worked at the video store called Black Dog Video, which literally just closed down only a few yeah. weeks ago. Um, so they lasted for a very long time. But So I was working at Black Dog Video, and there was a movie theater across the street called the Park Cinema. And next to that was a cafe called the Kino Cafe, which was also very like film centric in its culture and stuff. And so, for, between the theater and the video store, a lot of us would end up going to the Kino Cafe and drinking like after work. And so, this this kind of like fun neighborhood group of people formed. And somebody suggested like we should make some kind of a neighborhood zine or something, you know. And everybody was like, "You can be one of the people that writes for it." I was like, "No, forget it. I'm not doing that." And, uh, like, at the time, I had not done any writing, really, at all. Like, I was literally just a, like, a film fan. I watched films, and I would have movie marathons with my friends, but I didn't actively do anything with that experience. Who were you reading at that age? I mean, when you start writing, who, who were you looking up to? Who inspired your initial attempts at writing that film? I mean, well, when I first was writing about film, like, the, like the very first stuff, I mean, it would have been... Uh, like people like Tim Lucas and people like David Shaw and of course Maitland McDonough, like your Broken Mirrors, Broken Minds book was uh, totally changed. It totally changed. Like I didn't even know books could be like that about horror movies, you know. Thank so, you. <laughs> so it was. Uh, so I hadn't yet. I feel as though like a few years after that, I ended up making a friend in Sam McKinley. And he introduced me to, like, Eyeball Magazine, you know, and Flesh and Blood Magazine, and, like, Echo, and, you know, so, so my knowledge grew exponentially as soon as I met Sam, but I would say in those very early years, it was a lot of writers who had um, at least some uh, presence in the pages of Fangoria, you know, so it was, like, a lot of Fangoria stuff, and then the writers who were in that, you know, like Deep Red, you know, Chaz Ballin and stuff like this, so it was, like, a lot of writers who were in Fangoria and then had their own projects. I would kind of see what those people did because those were the writers I knew because Fangoria was the first horror magazine I read. And um, yeah, but I still didn't really uh, know what I was doing. And so this fanzine, you know, we decided to call it Wombat Vengeance because <laughs> nobody else thought of a name for it. And I was like, Wombat Vengeance. So that became the name. And it was just this like hodgepodge of stuff from the neighborhood. But after um, it just was like the rest of the people in the neighborhood lost interest in it very quickly, and so then I ended up being like the only, so I was the most resistant at first, and then I ended up being the only person who was keeping it going, and so then I was like, well, if, I, if I'm going to be paying to print this thing, then I'm making it all horror. <laughs> because it was not horror, it was just random stuff, you know, like people's poems or whatever, like stuff from the neighborhood, and so then I decided to change the name to Cannibal Culture and have it be a horror uh, zine. What was the, um, what was the coverage like? Was it reviews? Was it uh, festival coverage? Was in it Cannibal it Culture? Interview? Yeah, it was all that stuff. So it was like I would have uh, essays, you know, like sometimes written by myself, sometimes written by other people that I would hook into doing it. Uh, reviews of, of home video, reviews of books. Um, you know, like I would do uh, Fantasia Festival coverage, you know, I'd come to events and I would review events. Um, yeah, so it was just sort of like all the kinds of sections that you would see in Bangoria. You know, I would just be like, 
those kinds of things, except for, you know, I would say the, the essays were very different from anything in Bangori. The essays tended to lean a bit more on the academic side, and so then when I first discovered Eyeball, I would say that actually became the most important other magazine in terms of influencing what I ended up doing with cannibal culture. Um, yeah, so like Eyeball was where I discovered like Stephen Thrower and Daniel Bird and stuff, and Daniel Bird became huge influence on me. Um, and uh, but I, yeah, so I would say as cannibal culture went on, it was definitely inspired a lot by Eyeball specifically. Viewing bootlegs, then that you were getting. What oh, yeah. did your bootleg collecting that precede cannibal culture? Uh, it preceded it, but it was um, yeah. So I would buy bootlegs from European Trash Cinema, Video Search of Miami. There was like a Luminous Film and Video Works. Uh, there was like a place in Ontario. Oh, what was it? Rebic. Rebic. Um, Rebic Film Prodigies. Yeah, Rebic Film Prodigies. <laughs> I would order stuff from them. And um, so I was already doing that before I started my zine and before I started my festival. Um, and then at a certain point, I can't remember how or why, but my boss at Black Dog Video, Darren Gay, allowed me to start bringing some of these bootlegs and actually putting them on the shelves, which is totally illegal. Um, they're, they're closed down now, so they can't get in trouble anymore. But yeah, so he would let me like buy movies from European Trash Cinema, and actually, and they would come with like um, like no cover a lot of times. Um, so I would often be making the covers myself for like Flavia the Heretic or whatever, and I would just put them on the shelf. And uh, but like in Canada, we have obligatory ratings, you know. So you so a film has to be officially rated, or it's not legal. And the only people who can submit it for a rating are the distributor of that film. So if it doesn't have a distributor in Canada, um, there's nobody to put it through that process. Like I could not, as a video store employee, uh, submit a film, you know, for a rating. And also, they want to be paid for that rating, you know. So it's like the distributor has to submit it, pay the money, get the rating, you know. And so not only are you not allowed to put films on the shelf with no rating, um, but yeah, they just weren't available anywhere else because it was. I mean, we couldn't even get movies. You couldn't even buy legitimate, re legitimately released movies in the states. Like we would go down to Scarecrow Video all the time, and we would buy movies from them that were like actual domestic releases, but we still weren't allowed to be renting them on our shelves if they didn't have a Canadian distributor and a Canadian rating, you know? So it wasn't even just about the bootlegs, it was just the fact that, you know, bootleg plus unrated was like a double strike that we could have gotten in trouble for. So was the original, the original first iteration of Cinemuerte, it was just films that you were already a fan of from the bootlegs? Yeah. yeah, so it was like, the first year of Sin Muerte started because, you know, we, I was doing this fanzine and I was reviewing movies that were bootlegs mostly or unavailable domestically. And so one of the customers just started asking me, like, well, why don't, why don't you, why aren't you showing these movies somewhere? And I was like, I don't, what do you mean? I don't know how to show movies anywhere. And, uh... So, but then I just started looking into it, and I mean, people have heard me tell this story before, but, you know, we had a micro cinema in Vancouver, a great micro cinema called the Blinding Light Cinema that had something like 90 seats or something, and they had 16 millimeter and various forms of video, like, you know, HD cam, DV cam, whatever. And so, they didn't have 35 millimeter, though. And so, I just went there, and I asked the guy how much... Uh, I, I gave him a list of movies, of, of movies from my zine that people seemed to want to see, and I said, you know, if I give you this list of films, like, would you play some of these films? Because I think I can get people out to it from my magazine. And so I never heard from the guy. And then, like, months later, he called me. And he's like, okay, I'm doing the calendar for June. What dates did you want for your horror festival? <laughs> <laughs> and that was literally how it started. It was just like, I was like, I don't have a horror film festival. And, uh, and he was like, oh, I misunderstood that. I thought you wanted to, like, rent the theater. I was like, oh, well, how much is it to rent the theater? And it was 200 bucks, and I had just gotten my student loan. I feel like <laughs> um, and so, because this is like January or February when he's planning for June, so I would have just got my student loan in January at some point, you know? So I still had like a bunch of money from my student loan, and I was like, all right, so I just rented the theater with my student loan. 
And, but I still didn't know how to like legally show movies. You know, I had no connections. I had no, so I'm just thinking, I'm gonna bring my VHS tapes to this place <laughs> and play them. You know, these like bootleg, pal transfer, <laughs> shitty quality things. That's what I'm gonna play at my film festival. And uh, so Chris Pavoda, um, at him and Ashley Fester, uh, they had both moved from, um, from Montreal to Vancouver at the time, became members at Black Dog Video where I worked, and you know, so I had told them about what I wanted to do, and they had been um, involved in some way, or at least very close friends with all the people who did Fantasia, so they're like, oh, we'll totally help you, you know, so they introduced me to Mitch, and that changed everything, because obviously all of a sudden now it was not just like me with my VHS tapes. I was like, he was actually connecting me with like distributors and giving me some legitimacy. And I, you know, I was able to get film prints. He introduced me to York Woodgerite, you know, so that I could play York's films at the festival. Um, and so I still, half the movies I played that first year were still totally illegal bootlegs from PAL transfers, uh, including Possession. So Possession was, um, I played Possession and People hated it. Everybody hated it. It was just like people came out of the movie and, and they're just like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> everybody hated it, which is why I think it's so funny now that everybody loves possession so much. You know, it's like everybody has possession t shirts and like possession, like 50 million variants of like artists' renditions of the poster. And just like, yes, yeah, so, like people love possession. It is now like a canonical film, you know? But at that time, it was like, people just didn't get it at all, you know? And people were like, actually like pissed off at me, like, like ripped them off somehow like, showing this movie. And side note, Daniel Berg, who you just mentioned, wrote a great essay about the rising reputation of possession in recent years in uh, Animus magazine, and he credits Kayla with, uh, substantially with uh, you know, breaking that film for a whole new generation of uh, fans. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, that was very nice. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that was that was how I started Cinemuerte. It was an accident, and um, but I liked it. You know, it was like I liked that. You know, you think sometimes this before that. I mean, the internet existed then, but it was not. There wasn't a lot on it, or whatever. <laughs> there wasn't a lot on IMDb really then. You know, and so. Um, I just had no idea that there were all these people in Vancouver that liked horror movies, you know, because I was like, because when I did the festival, they came in from everywhere. They came in from, uh, I mean, some people like this guy, Greg Saunier, came in from Calgary and he kept coming in every year from Calgary for the festival, you know, but, but having people in Vancouver and then in all this kind of suburbs around Vancouver, like having them all come in for this festival and being like, wow, there's actually a hundred horror fans in this city. And like, I didn't, no. Um, and so that was really cool because I think everybody who came to that festival the first year thought they were the only horror fan, you know? And then they were all as equally amazed as I was where they're meeting each other and just being like, wow, you know? Like, and they would start talking to each other during the smoke breaks and stuff. And, uh, and then by the second year, they started coming together to the festival. And then by the third and fourth year, they were like making films together and stuff, you know? So that was awesome. I know that you had some amazing guests at this festival, and were you ever intimidated, intimidated approaching any of them, or were you ever starstruck, or were you just too focused on your festival being great to even be intimidated by Udo Kier? Or a, uh... The weird thing is, I people always say, like, the more you do public speaking, or the more you do these things, the more jaded you get, and the more... Uh, comfortable with it you get but I've actually had the total opposite experience where like at the very beginning because I didn't know what the hell I was doing um I just did like whatever you know like I didn't think of it and then as it, my career went on and I felt there were more expectations on like whatever I would do then I started to be more and more inti easily intimidated I refused to st like I stopped wanting to call people on the phone you know like um but yeah but at first it was just like um, back then when you would invite people, it was all by fax, you know, so it was like, you didn't really call people, you faxed them, and so I invited Jean Roland by fax, so it was like, uh, the first year, 
that I had guests. So I didn't actually have guests the first year. I had guests the second year. And it was Jean Merlin and Jörg Woodgerait. And Jörg Woodgerait I had met here at Fantasia the summer before. And we had spent all this time hanging out. And so I was like, OK, well, you got to come to my festival. And the same year, I had Jean Merlin. And um, you know anybody who has seen Kat Ellinger's great documentary about Jean Merlin knows the story of how I accidentally invited him to the festival. Um, <laughs> because I didn't realize that when someone asks to be invited to the festival, it means you're paying for them to go there. <laughs> And, uh, but so that was like how Jean ended up coming, but it was weird. I was not intimidated at all. I just, I mean, I was more worried about his health, to be honest, because he was like, I mean, he was like really happy and, and, and his wife was a spitfire, Simone. I loved her. You know, she had so much energy and Jean apparently just loved traveling and having adventures and stuff. So it didn't matter how sick he was. He just didn't want to miss out on anything fun, you know? And, uh. And then Udo, it was a, it was a very weird thing because I had uh, I had a friend in common. I think it was Norm Hill, who at the time worked at Scarecrow Video, but also had been involved in the Anchor Bay DVD of Possession. He had been involved in the uh, the Monty Hellman releases that Anchor Bay was doing. You know, so he was helping subversive, to put together subversive films. Is also here. yeah, he went on to do subversive films, and he also went on to do some stuff with David Lynch's company, I think too. Um, but at the time, he was like working at Scarecrow Video in doing like promotions and marketing and stuff, and then also doing these extras for Anchor Bay. And um, he had worked with Udo before, and so he gave me Udo's fax number. <laughs> so I faxed Udo. And all, honestly, all I offered him was a coach flight from LA to Vancouver and, you know, whatever, five nights in the hotel. And I think Udo can sometimes suss out pretty quickly what resources, you know, the festival has. I think it was pretty obvious as soon as he arrived, this girl has no money. I'm not going to be able to get anything out of this festival. <laughs> <laughs> and so then he just put on his kind of like worker bee hat. And he ended up being like deciding he was going to be an ambassador for this festival. The whole time he was in town, he was going around telling everybody they should give me money. <laughs> he was carrying film prints. Everybody, anybody who's ever picked up a film print knows how heavy these things are. They're like 75 pounds or whatever. Udo Kier carried a film print up the stairs at the Pacific, Pacific Cinematheque in Vancouver for me. He also would go to Starbucks and get me coffee. <laughs> he was like just amazing, you know? And he also, we had that year, the year that he was there, so that was the third year, that was when I met Buddy Giovanazzo, who did the first video. Uh, him and Udo came the same year, and um, <laughs> that year we, we were playing the movie The Black Belly of the Tarantula, the Jallo film, and, uh, and it arrived in, it was like only in Italian. <laughs> and so we didn't have any, you know, there was, it was like too late to do anything about it. Did you, if I remember, did you print out the dialogue and into a script that you performed? Yes. <laughs> so, so that's what we had to do is, I, you know, so I wrote up the dialogue. No, 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 sorry. I did that for a different thing. What we did at Cine Muerte was that I had a crappy bootleg VHS tape of Black Belly of the Tarantula that was subtitled. So what we did was we set up a little TV at the back of the <laughs> cinema and then our plan was that we were going to play the tape at the same time that the movie started, and we would look at the subtitles on the TV, and then we would just read out like what they said. <laughs> and you know, Udo Kier heard that we were going to do this, and he was like, "I want to do John Carlo Giannini's voice." <laughs> so I was like, "Great!" You know, so then it was like me and Udo and my friend Kelly Salerno. And then Anthony Timpson, uh, who many of you know, he you know he used to, for many years was a programmer, fanzine writer, and then recently made his uh, first feature with Come to Daddy, um, and also yeah produced lots of people's films. But so he was at the festival and he was in charge of the remote control for the VHS tape. And what happened was you know I didn't know enough about film at the time to know that the film speed was not going to be running at the same speed as the VHS tape. <laughs> And so the whole time it was going, like, the, they're just moving at different speeds. So we're all sitting there looking at the TV and going like this, you know. So we're just, like, the whole time we're just doing this, like, looking at the TV, looking at the screen. And we're realizing it's, like, out of sync. And so Anthony is, like, sitting on the floor frantically with the remote control trying to, like, get the thing, the 
tape to match up again with the movie. And it was, yeah, it was crazy. It was just like the most impossible thing to do, but people were laughing their heads off and like everybody who missed it. Because at that time also, Jallo films were totally unknown. People didn't know what that word meant. Um, and so we, I would always do kind of a Jallo double bill on Fridays of the festival, but almost no one would ever come to it. And it was always a very small crowd of people who liked those films then. Um, and so yeah, it would have been like Black Belly, The Tarantula, and something else. And um, but yeah, but all those people were like, I'm so glad I came to this, you know? So when I think about Cine Muerte's uh, programming, I think about all the films that kind of toe the line between exploitation and art house that you tended to gravitate towards. And that's something that has really kind of caught on more in recent years, too. You were kind of ahead of your time just in that, I hate the elevated horror term, but I mean, you were, you were kind of pushing what people's uh, expectations of what horror could be were at that time with your program. Yeah, and I think, again, a lot of that came from Eyeball, you know? Like, I mean, because Eyeball's writing, the kinds of films they covered were, that was the intersection of stuff, you know? And and then my friend Sam McKinley also was, like, so important in the programming in the sense that, you know, he sort of got to know my taste, and then he would start recommending things to me that seemed like Kayla type of movies. Um, and, you know, he's very into like transgressive visual arts and like just uh you know like um noise music and and avant-garde art you know so a lot of the types of things he would recommend to me also kind of skirted those boundaries and uh and so we ended up having this like um i would say yeah the programming often was very arty except for we would usually have the midnights be you know like pieces and stuff because pe everybody goes crazy for pieces you know <laughs> Uh, so you always had to have movies like that because, like, for the average person, those are their touchstones. Those are the films they know, and you got to get the people to kind of trust that you're going to play stuff for them, or else they just won't come anymore. Um, and so, yeah, we, all, we there was definitely lots of stuff that played that had the same response that like Possession had, where people were not into it. But I would say by the third year or something, people just started to come more open to that. You know, they, like more open to the idea that those were the kinds of films they were going to get, and they were like <coughs> ready for it. Did you have the support of the media coverage at that time? I mean, as a local horror institution, you were the only horror festival in the area. But I know horror has a kind of stigma. Yeah, almost none. It was like, and when I first did the festival, like I would say, the very last year I did it in like 2005 or something, we got good press for the first time ever. Um, but when the whole like first four or five years or whatever. Um, not only were they just not interested, you know, like I would occasionally find someone who worked for the Georgia Strait that would include it in like a roundup thing of like events happening this week, you know, and there'd be like a couple events that would be highlighted, but even then it would be like two sentences. It wouldn't be like an interview with the guests or anything, you know, and um but I remember that, you know, when I first started doing it, I would get so mad about it because I felt like, I felt like entitled to get that press. Like, I just thought, like, that's what the press does. They have to, you, if you put on an event, they have to cover it. It's their job, you know? And so then I would get mad at them, like, you're not doing your job. <laughs> and they'd be like, fuck you. I'm definitely not giving you any coverage now, you know? But I was like, I totally thought that that was how it worked, was like that, they were supposed to cover every single movie that played. And it took me a while to realize that, like, no, they they just pick what they want to write about, you know? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so I did not have a good relationship with the press in Vancouver because I just didn't understand how it worked. And then I moved to Austin in, like, 2003 and started programming for the Draft House. And it was totally different where we would have these monthly meetings with the press, where it was like the whole point of the meeting was to flatter and schmooze them into like doing coverage of whatever was coming up in the calendar, you know? And I was like, oh, this is how you do it. You know? Before we get to Alamo in your, in your trajectory, I, I wanted to ask, I mean, the, the kind of playful uh, event, event style screens that you do where there's another element like the um, like the torture garden like the things that have like a little bit extra that is a um, is that something that you did you ever experience other screenings as a uh, audience member that were atypical not just going to the movie and watching it but things that had a 
they are active quality, a, a, a sense of fun, a sense of Not fun. really. I mean, I think, I, not, that's not to say there was nobody doing stuff like that, but I'm just saying, like, I think I, th I, I thought of doing those types of things to make up for the cheapness of the events I was doing. <laughs> it was like try. it was basically trying to cover for, like, the shitty quality of the mm -hmm. paddle transfers or whatever was just like, what can you do to like, give people so they don't feel like ripped off, you know? And it was like always trying to think of like more things you could give them so that they would overlook the shambolic nature of getting a ticket or whatever, you know, because it was often me, like the people would phone me at my house, like my phone number was on everything and they would just call me if they wanted tickets for stuff, you know? <laughs> It was so crazy to think of now. But, um, you know, so it was very disorganized. Like, so often to, to get away with that, I would try to think of, like, crazy stuff I could, like, add on so that they would remember that and not remember how disorganized it was. Um, but the torture garden was a... I actually thought that someone else had done that. So the torture garden, how that worked was, it was a marathon that I would do every year to as a fundraiser. And it's, you know, it was like 12 hours, and it was free to get in, but you pay to get out. <laughs> and so it started at $20, and then it went down a dollar every hour that you stayed. And, um, and I always play the most irritating or grating movie first to drive people out, so they pay 20 bucks. Um, but they also couldn't be all shit movies because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do the same fundraiser again the next year like you had to show stuff that was just crazy i remember the first fun first year of torture garden i showed like mad foxes you know and this was before people knew what mad foxes was um and yeah, i don't remember what else i think the very the first thing i played the very was mermaid in a manhole with a live oh, score yeah. by a harsh noise band <laughs> <laughs> And there was like a guy who came, like literally like 10 minutes later, he came up, he's like, it's just, here's my 20 bucks, take my money. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but so, but I had thought I was actually copying that idea from someone else. I thought that I had read something about how the first button a -thon, not to shout out button a -thon, but <laughs> but, you know, I had thought that that was the payment structure at Buttonamathon because I had not been there and I had only heard about it and that was what I thought the payment structure was there, that it was free to get in, you pay to get out. And I was like, wow, what a great idea. And so I'm going to steal that idea. And I would always tell people in early interviews or things like, you know, that I had taken the idea from that. And then when I ended up moving to Austin and I asked people about it, they were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not how it worked. And I was just like, oh. Well, I, I misunderstood then, and that was, you know, so I guess maybe it was an original idea, but I thought I was ripping off somebody. Um, but yeah, so I, but often I would do those things mostly to hide cheapness. Okay. Yeah, the Saturday morning cartoon party started at, I think, the last year of Santa Muerte, and part of that was because... I always uh, would give, I always had a marathon, an all night marathon, and I would serve breakfast to people after the marathon. And, um, but I would, you know, I went through several years of struggling to feed people because I would order meals from like the Air National House of Pancakes or whatever. Like they would deliver the food, you know, I'd like pre order all these like pancake breakfasts for people. By the time they get out of the movie, it's cold. You know, and just like just mishaps like that, where I would try to order food for people and it would never work. And then uh, my friend Torin Atkinson uh, in Vancouver used to have his birthday party at his house every year, where he would just invite people over starting very early in the morning. You know, it was like five o'clock in the morning is when it started, uh, because it was supposed to simulate like an actual getting up early Saturday morning type of thing. You know, and so he and he would have a program. Um, of vintage cartoons that he would play nonstop till noon, and on his table was a smorgasbord of cereal, you know? And so, and he would just pay for it himself for his friends, you know? And so, like, you'd just go and be eating cereal all morning, watching these cartoons, and it was a fun thing he did. But that was where I got the idea to make cereal the food for the, after the marathon, because it was like, you know, it's not gonna be cold, it's not gonna get wrecked, and you can actually even return any unopened boxes of cereal, you know, for a full refund. Um, so it's also like the cheapest thing to do.
Um, but then, so, so at first, the cereal was actually just a part of the food for the marathon, and then I think it was the year after that when I actually made the cartoon party itself, like an event. Um, and I started doing it around, I, I worked at the Alamo Draft House the last two years of Cine Muerte. I was like living in Texas, but I would come back, you know, for Cine Muerte. And so I started this cartoon party in Austin at the same time. Uh, so I was doing it in both cities, and um, and the funny thing is, like all so many other programmers around the U.S. started copying the cereal party from the Alamo, and they wouldn't even credit the Alamo, let alone me. You know, so it was like they would. It was it was very weird. It was a thing I always had an issue with. Like as a programmer, I was like you always credit other programmers. You know, like if they have an idea and you think it's a really good idea and you want to do it, it's always a great idea to reach out to that programmer and say, I love that idea that you had. Like, can I steal that or whatever? And so it always kind of bugged me when like all these people would look at draft house programming and not even just that, but but all kinds of draft house programming and they would just copy it around the country. And, you know, they wouldn't credit the draft house and, um, you know, and it wasn't even a draft house initiative. It was actually my personal initiative that I kind of gave to the draft house because I worked there. But, um, but yeah, that's off topic, but yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> Before you went to Alamo Draft House, you, uh, you had your own theater, the Criminal Cinema. Mm -hmm. And, uh, has anyone somebody been, said, mm -hmm. has somebody yeah, been there? I remember it well. Oh my God. <laughs> I was going to ask if anyone here had been to the criminal cinema. But, uh, wow. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but you had been there before. Yeah. Um, because this was your first foray into running a theater. Can you tell me uh, about that experience? Yeah. So I'd been doing Sin Muerte for a few years. And there was a producer I met here at Fantasia, David Witten. He was the producer of uh, Sex, the Annabelle Chong story that was playing here one year, and he also had been, in the 70s, had worked for Hallmark Films and had been basically the marketing guy that came up with Last House on the Left's promotional campaign. And, um, you know, so he would always regale us with these stories of, like, working for Hallmark Theaters and working for the Pussycat Theater chain and stuff like this. And so... Um, you know, we knew this other guy in Vancouver named Dimitri Otis, who was kind of like, um, him and Robin Bougie were kind of like the porn experts in town, you know, the vintage porn guys. And so there was still a porno theater in Vancouver called the Fox Theater that ran 35 millimeter. It was actually the last 35 millimeter porno theater in all of North America. And both, I don't know if Robin had a relationship with it, but Dimitri definitely did. Dimitri was very into seeing like what they had in their archives because back in the day, Porno theaters would pay a certain amount of money for a print, and they would like buy the print, and they would keep the print, and they had the rights to exhibit the print for the life of the print. So as long as that print lasted, they could have the rights to still play it. And so this place had been playing the same movie since the <laughs> 70s, like the same print, and they were, it was like a disaster. Like they were so chopped up, and like if you went in their projection booth, there's just frames like all over the floor like like burnt frames or whatever I remember going up there once and like picking up a like a little strip of film from the floor I picked it up and it was actually the blowjob scene from Deep Throat <laughs> like just sitting there on the floor you know and uh, but so Dimitri started having a relationship with them because he wanted to try to preserve the prints they had you know because they were not taking they didn't care about them really at all and he did so he was trying to like create a relationship with them, and through that, we sort of found out that, you know, they're not making a lot of money at this theater, so we had the idea that, like, David Witten, me, and my boss, Darren, at Black Dog Video would kind of go in on a project where we would try to pitch them on giving us the theater on weekends. Um, because it turned out that, for whatever reason, the porno theater made more money in, in the week than on the weekend. And so we were like, well, what if we take your weekends and we'll do like repertory cinema on the weekends, and then you still have porn the rest of the week. And so Dimitri Otis, I think, was instrumental in uh, liaising and helping us orchestrate this. But so we went there for our first, uh, I don't know, the first, you know, it, it was not very well thought out. <laughs> but, <laughs> So we went there for our first, like, to plan, you know, I think we, we took over two weeks or something before our first movie so that we could try to, like, clean the place up somehow. So we, like, painted the lobby, and we, um, 
well, there was nothing we could do about the seats, so basically we would give the people garbage bags when they came in, so that they would like put a garbage bag if they weren't comfortable sitting on the seats. And um, and the girls' bathroom, it was funny, the girls' bathroom had like never been used. It was like, <laughs> it was like a storage room, so all the mops and stuff were in there. And, uh, and so I got... You know, much to my great shame now, uh, but I, you know, I'm a child of the '70s, so I have got a giant mural of Scott Baio painted in the women's bathroom. <laughs> Which, of course, I wouldn't do now, knowing what we know. But, um, but at the time, I was a huge, well, as a kid, I was a huge Scott Baio fan, and so I was like, I'm just gonna have this mural painted. And Eliza Navari, who also I had met here at Fantasia, she's the one who painted it, and. Um, so we just tried to do, like disinfect the place as good as we could, and it just smelled like urine. And uh, the first movie we played was Meet the Feebles because uh, David Gregg, or not David Gregg, <laughs> uh, David Witten was the distributor. He had a company called Grey Cat Films, and so he uh, he he had a, a various number numbers of prints that he had rights to through his own company, and Meet the Feebles was one of them. So we played it because it was free to get. And uh, so we did really well the first night. We got a special occasion license for booze, and people came, and but then they never came again. After <laughs> it was just like um, it stank. I hear it. And but I loved it. You know, it was like I didn't care that it smelled like urine. I was like, you know, and the projector was so such a mess. It had not been serviced or cleaned in so long that we had this print of Mark of the Devil that had just been like like a newly struck print of Mark of the Devil because David Witten also distributed that and we went it went through the projector one time and it came out the other end completely black. Oh. <laughs> Covered in grease and stuff, you know, like just the project and David was like, okay, we've got to get this projector cleaned, you know, because then we, you know, he was gonna have to get that print professionally cleaned now, you know. Um, but yeah, so it was just everything was broken, things didn't work. Like, I mean, we were just too overly excited at the idea of like having our own theater. And then I was the programmer, and my only experience as a programmer is programming Cine Muerte, where when you do a festival, it's kind of like you you just kind of shoot your wad one time and the whole rest of the year you you can make the money back, whatever you lose, you know, you it's just like, you know, everything's focused on this one week, all your budget for the whole year, and so you just kind of blow all the money. And that's not how you can program a theater that has to be operating constantly every week. So it was just so, I was programming so many movies, like each weekend, I would just program, I don't know, like 10 movies. You know, like, and so the shipping that you're paying for film prints is so crazy that we just started losing money like crazy. The shipping, the prints, it was the shipping was really, yeah, expensive. Yeah. And that's not an element that necessarily programs today have to face with yeah. digital. But yeah. I feel like if, if, if things had been DCP or something back then where you could like download a ProRes, the criminal cinema might still be going. <laughs> but it was, yeah, the film ship, because if you're shipping in like 10 prints just for one weekend, yeah. that shipping bill is insane, you know, like, because the whole, for Cine Muerte, you know, it was like nine days or something, and I would be playing about 26 films. For that whole festival so the money I needed to raise all year was for 26 films and then here I was at Criminal Cinema playing 10 films just in one weekend so that's like half the budget of Cine Muerte you know yeah. in shipping was it all rep screens or did you do anything that was a new release was no we did all rep because they only had 35 millimeter okay. they didn't have any other format okay and I know that uh, Tim Lee Drunken Lee offered you a job with Alamo before Criminal Cinema yeah, so Tim Lee had come up to San Muerte when I was doing the festival, and I met him through Anthony Timpson, and uh, him and Carrie, Carrie Lee, his wife, they both came up, and um, they were just impressed that it, it was so, like, DIY, you know, and then I was at the Sitges Film Festival because um, they had a year, I guess it was 2002 or something, but they had a year where there was, like, a big Spaghetti Western retrospective. It was huge. And they had like a massive book they printed with it and everything. So like me and Anthony Timson went to the festival primarily for that, like just to see all these westerns. And Tim Lee, we, we all got drunk one night, and then Tim got drunk and was just like, "Okay, you need to come and work for us. Like you can, you know, you can come and work at the Alamo and blah blah blah." And I said like, 
No, because I, you know, I'm going to start my own theater. I'm going to start this, like, criminal cinema thing, and, and you know, that's what I want to do, or whatever. And, of course, the criminal cinema tanked after three months. So then I called Tim, and I was like, okay, I changed my mind. I want to come and work for you. And he was like, what are you talking about? Like, he had no memory. <laughs> And, uh, but he was good, he was true to his word, even though he didn't remember it. He was just like, well, come on down, I'm sure we can find something for you to do, you know. So tell me about the transition to Austin, because I, I, you know, I think, um, since, since the last time I interviewed you, I read Warped and Fainted, the oral history of the Alamo Craft Taps and, and the Wednesday, and it sounds like that was a really happy time in your life. I mean, it's, it's the impression Oh, yeah. I had. First, the first two years I worked there, I was, like, in heaven, you know, because it was, like, my opinion was respected by somebody that was actually willing to put money into like programming so that I didn't have to pay for it myself. Um, he was very into special events. He was very into like having guests in from out of town. So I just started meeting like so many of my heroes and stuff like through that job. Um, and I learned so much about like showmanship and film exhibition and stuff and just, yeah, I don't know. I just learned so much. It was so stimulating and interesting to me. And it was like, um, yeah, I was working with like Lars Nilsson, Zach Carlson. Uh, it was just like a great team of programmers that worked there. How long before you had uh, the, the means to program your own things like Music Monday, was that? built into the role from the beginning, or did you have to work your way up? Well, I had to work my, I had to pitch Tim on that idea, and at first he thought it was a shitty idea because he was sort of like, well, we're in a music town, like, people can just go see live music if they care about music, and I was like, yeah, but they can't go see, like, Klaus Nomi play or something, <laughs> and so we could play, like, the movie about Klaus Nomi, and, um, so he was like, all right, if you want to try it, then, you know, he gave me a slot in December, two days before Christmas, a Monday. <laughs> So he gave me two slots, like the 7 and 9 o'clock slot on, like, December 23rd. And it's like, Mondays are the most dead day. And both screenings sold out. And it was like, and what I played was, like, just shit I made myself. So I made a, uh, my friend Hope Peterson calls, she's a video artist, she calls them bibliodocs. Because they're, like, documentaries, but just completely made out of footage that already exists. This is something I found interesting because I didn't know this about you before, and I mean, this is kind of the beginning of you as a filmmaker, at least found footage, bibliodocs, and it, it was, how did you, I mean, did, did they teach you how to edit, you know, were you already editing in Canada? Well, no, no, I was not editing in Canada. I started editing when I worked at the Draft House, and it was like, um, I think the first two that I made, I got someone else to edit, you know, so I think the bubble, there was like a bubblegum music one. Oh, sorry, no, it was not bubblegum at first. It was uh, glam rock. I did a glam rock one, and I did like a Serge Gainsbourg one. And I cannot remember who edited them, but somebody else edited them. And then he, we started all learning how to edit on Premiere because Tim wanted us all to do everything. You know, So we would lay out the, our pages in the program, like the program would be divided up between all the programmers, and we would have to learn how to do layout to do our own pages. And then we also had to learn how to edit so that we could edit trailers for our own events that we programmed, you know. So everybody, all of us were kind of learning rudimentary editing while we worked there. And so then I made uh, probably my most ambitious of those bibliodocs, which was uh, called Bubblegum Music is the Naked Truth. And it is based on the book of the same name. And I actually got permission from that, like for all the writers of that book. Like I actually made a script out of, out of all the writing from the book, you know, with their blessing. And um, that was the first thing I edited myself. That was the first one I did myself. So. And what were the events like then? I mean, were you pitching events like even the um, the road show kind of screenings where you're you're taking the films to locations uh, you know, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Is that all happening right away, or is that something that you also have to pitch? Well, they so the Alamo already had this thing called the Rolling Road Show, but at the time it was only local and it was like in the you know so it was like in Austin and in the immediate vicinity of Austin like the other towns you know San Antonio or uh, whatever like all the places that are around like Buda Texas smaller smaller towns and stuff and so they had this truck that had two 35 they had a 35 millimeter changeover system in the truck they also had hydraulics on the truck so that they could park on like uneven ground mm -hmm. 
and then they had a gigantic inflatable screen. And now this is normal, but at the time it was not. This inflatable screen at the time was like the envy of like the film exhibition community. You know, like nobody had that. And so they would go around and do screenings outside, and they would be usually free because like somebody like a bank or some sponsor would usually sponsor it to be like movies in the park, you know, or something like that. And I think it was like me and Anthony Timpson that had the idea that they should go further with this. And you should, you know, I think it was originally we were like, you should go to the, you know, hotel from The Shining and like show The Shining there. Mm -hmm. And that became the first, that, you know, that spark of an idea became the first like national rolling roadshow tour. So the very first year we did that roadshow, it was like we did Planet of the Apes in uh, Lake Powell, Utah. We did uh, The Searchers in Monument Valley. We did, I mean, one of the most amazing ones, we did Close Encounters of the Third Kind at the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Um, yeah, so we just kind of drove around, and uh, and then that continued for a few years. You know, they did those those tours. But the very first year of the Rolling Road Show, I was actually in charge of all the, like, locations. Like, I had to book, like, find partners locally and get them to give us space to, like, show a movie. One thing I thought was interesting is how Programming and exhibition really is what kind of sets you up to become a documentary producer and filmmaker later on as far as like developing contacts. I mean, I think, am I right that you track down the people that were the warriors that had never been part of that convention world? Now that's what they do, but did yeah. you find them long? They were all kind of either out of the business or not. A lot of them were out of the business, yes. Yeah. So the, so the first three people I got for the Warrior, we did we did a Warriors thing as part of the Rolling Road show in Coney Island. And so the idea was we'd have a thing called the Road Rally where it's like a scavenger hunt all through New York going through the path of like the Warriors trying to get back to Coney Island. So all the people made teams and they all dressed up in costumes and then they had to start at the park you know, where Cyrus gets shot and then they have to make their way on the subway to Coney Island. And so I was in charge of getting the warriors there. And so uh, Deborah Van Valkenburg and Michael Beck, I knew uh, because we had done a Streets of Fire, or sorry, Michael Beck we knew because, because he had done a Xanadu event with us, and I knew uh, Deborah Van Valkenburg from doing Streets of Fire. And um, so they were kind of the first two people we got um, they gave us a contact for like one of the other cast members that they were still good friends with. Uh, James Remar, I think we had to go through an agent. He was still like on TV and everything. He, he was like more active than a lot of the other ones. So, so he was like just going through an agent, but he didn't show up. So he didn't, he didn't come. Um, but then a lot of the other people were, you know, so like Dorsey Wright was like driving a subway, I think, and it was like Terry Michos was a news anchor in upstate New York. And um, so it, it was like, I would just go in the phone book because like how many people are named Dorsey Wright, you know? And, uh, and I just would call, cold call people and be like, are you so-and-so? And so we got a bunch of the people out there um, and through that they met up with, um, you know, the people who ended up becoming their convention management, you know, so that, that as a group they would all go and do conventions all the time after that. Yeah, I've seen them many times. I, I, I never told them like, I don't know why <laughs> They would remember me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now, you, it's, and then, so you're doing Cinema where say, still simultaneously with Alamo for a little bit, but eventually you relocate back and you do Blue Sunshine. Well, so I went to Alamo, I was there for four years, then I left Texas and moved to Winnipeg for two years. And I was working at the Winnipeg Film Group. Uh, and then from there I left and came here to Montreal and with my good friend Dave, well actually Dave Bertrand was not my good friend at the time. He became one of my best friends. But at the time we barely knew each other. Um, Dave Bertrand was from Vancouver and he would always be a person who participated in my 48 hour film contest I would do there. Like, so he would be like a producer of teams and stuff, and his teams would often win. They did really good films, and um, and so I was in Winnipeg, and I had this idea that I just wanted to move to Montreal and open a micro cinema. I was like determined to do this, but I knew I couldn't do it alone, and I needed a partner. And I was like, who can be my partner? And I have no idea what in the world prompted me to contact Dave Bertrand because, like I said, we 
we didn't, we barely knew each other at all. It was like we had met in passing, like at these things. But for some reason, I just had this in my head, that's the guy. That's the guy you got to start the theater with. And so I contacted him like out of the blue. And I was just like, you know, like I want to do this theater. I want to, you know, and he was living in Toronto. And he was like, had a girlfriend. He had a life there, you know. And so I'm like, I'm going to move to Montreal. And, and I want to open a micro cinema. And I want, I pick you. <laughs> And he was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> and so, you know, and of course, his, his girlfriend was like, excuse me, you know, like, what? And uh, so luckily, she was an amazing sport about it, you know, and, um, you know, and they're married now and have children and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, so Dave moved there and he and I found this place on Saint Laurent and it was like an old office. And it was kind of funny because over the year, you know, when people would come to the movies there, so many people would walk in and be like, this used to be my office, or I used to live here, or whatever, you know, like, um, there were people who had connections to that place somehow, um, but we lived there and had the theater there. What, there was a Men Without Hats left Yeah, somebody from Men Without Hats lived there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You live behind the screens? Yeah, so we had a screen that came down from the ceiling, and then behind the screen was, like, our little office and the two bedrooms. So we lived there, and then... But nobody knew it was there. Everybody just thought that where the screen was was the end of the room, but there's actually like three more rooms back there. Other than the venue not smelling of pee, what did you know <laughs> differently? <laughs> Having the experience of criminal cinema, what did you know going in that you were going to do differently? I mean, for one thing, I knew I had to keep the overhead low. Yeah. You know, it was like just keep the overhead as low as possible. The rent was really expensive, so that was like the biggest thing we had to pay for, but I knew that we just had to keep shipping low, you know, and because uh, that's the thing that had broke me the first time was the shipping. So we made deals with collectors like Harry Guero and Scott Moffat, who ran the Cosmic Hex Archive in San Francisco, and they had like huge collections of like 16 millimeter prints. And we were set up for 16, we couldn't do 35, it was just 16 and video that we did. And so we would contact them and we would book like a bulk order of films all at once and we would get them to send us like just a whole bunch of films at once because it turned out it was actually way chip cheaper to ship a whole bunch of 16 millimeter prints than to ship one. You know, so it was like we would do, we would book six months worth of films from them. They'd ship them all in one giant box. Um, and then at the end of the six months, we would ship them back and we'd get a new shipment of films, you know. So that was one way. And then we also would contact filmmakers and just ask them to give us a break for, a, uh, I think it was six months or something like that. We were like, okay, we're just starting for the first six months. Would you waive your fees or whatever? And everybody pretty much did, so. And did you, because I, I read an essay that you wrote about your experience with this theater, and it sounded like you were running into red tape from day one as far as uh, bureaucracy getting in the way of you trying to run this theater. And it even required your uh, customers to become members, I guess, to get around certain things. Well, that was, that was not a requirement of the government. I just did that because I knew in Vancouver that was a way to get around film ratings. If you had like a closed membership yeah. system, you could charge somebody a dollar for a membership or whatever, and then you could show unrated films, like at the Pacific Cinematheque or whatever. That's how they would do it. Um, so that was really just something where I was thinking this is like an extra thing we can do to protect ourselves somehow. But, yeah, so we, before we rented this place, we obviously did due dil diligence of checking the zoning on the building, you know. And so the zoning for the, for the space was that it was currently zoned as an office, but it was eligible to be rezoned for these like other two or three zones, you know. Um, and so that was the only reason why we went ahead and got it was because, uh, you know, we asked them, well, what do we have to do? And they're like, oh, you got to come in, you're going to have to pay like 500 bucks or something to switch the zone, and then you'll get a new certificate. Or, you know, so they just made it seem like it was like no big deal. And so we're like, great. You know, so we like sign the lease that we go to get our zoning changed. And they're like, oh, you can't change the zone. And we're like, what do you mean? <laughs> and they're like, well, uh, you know, and they just started, get, they were like, well, you can't change the zone because, um, you need to have like a, a fire inspection or whatever. And we were like, okay, so we get the fire inspection. The fire inspection tells us that we have to change the doors into fire doors. So uh, we start looking into that and it's ridiculously expensive, but we were like willing to do it. But then we had, 
they said that, uh, so the back door, the back door of the place, they said, well, a fire door opens outwards, and you can't open your fire door outwards because your building property line actually mm -hmm. runs right up where the building ends is the end of the property line. So if you open the door outwards, you're opening it onto city space. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to open a door outwards onto city space. But we're on the third floor. It's like opening onto our own fire escape. So we're like, we're not going to hit a pedestrian. Like, open the door. It's like three stories up. And they're like, well, it doesn't matter because it's blah, blah, blah. And then it was like, well, you can't add the door anyway because it's a heritage building. Um, so we, by this point, we'd already spent like six thousand dollars, like getting uh, inspections and like all these things, and it was just. And we had, you know, we'd arrived a month before our opening date, thinking that within that month we'll be ready to go. So this date of when we were supposed to open, which was like June twenty, what what's Jean Baptiste Day? It was the day after Jean Baptiste Day? Is that the twenty sixth? Twenty fourth. Twenty fourth. Okay, so it was the twenty fifth that we opened. And, but we were like, okay, we have to just open. Like we, otherwise we're screwed because this place is really expensive to rent. We just have to open. And so then it was totally an illegal theater the whole time it existed. And we never had any permit. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was literally the criminal cinema. But so then we made, we made the um, membership thing because we wanted to sell booze, which also was totally illegal. We would literally go to the depot on the corner and just like carry a bunch of beer back. And, and then we made it so that you would get a free beer with your ticket. And then, I don't know, there was some stupid thing like we would give you a beer koozie or something like that and you'd get, you'd get paid for the beer koozie and you could get a free beer with it or something. I don't know, there was just like stupid things that we would think of to try to use as excuses, like if we ever got caught, you know? Uh, none of which would have worked, but um, but yeah. So so it was yeah. So that was Blue Sunshine that was here, and it was it was great. I mean, it was harrowing. It was a harrowing experience running that place because it was also you know there were just constantly unexpected bills and stuff. But how long did it last? Was it three years? Two two years. We had a two year lease, and we lasted out our lease. Nobody thought we would last out our lease, but we did it. The other two people defaulted on their lease, and we were still there. So we were actually the most responsible tenants in the building, even though people thought we were like the deadbeats of the building. <laughs> were you, when do you start writing? When do you start writing for places like Fangoria? Does this come around this time, or does this come a little later? Oh, it was way earlier. So I started writing for Fangoria in like 1999. Yeah, so it was the it was the very first year I did Cinema Arte, and the first year I came to Fantasia, I met Tony Timpong, and he saw my fanzine and was just like, "Oh, you live in Vancouver? We can always use people to go do set visits, you know, in Vancouver." And so I had to go cover stuff like Freddy versus Jason, I think, and like, uh, oh my God, what was it? One of the Hellraiser movies. Um, <laughs> And uh, I don't know, just mostly franchise things, you know, Turn of the Corn Part 8 or whatever. And, uh, but I hated doing those things because I hated going on sets. I was just like, this is the most dull thing because usually they would just be doing the same take, like the same, or the same scene, like over and over and over and over again. And I remember one time I had to write about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like the remake of it or whatever, and I wrote this whole thing about the wallpaper. <laughs> and Gingold, who was my editor, was just like, you cannot write all about the wallpaper. It has to talk about like how many people die or like the special effects or whatever. And I was like, well, I didn't see anything like that. All I saw was wallpaper. So that's what I wrote about. It was like I wrote about the beautiful production design and the, you know, like the the uh, embroidered signs that were on the wall and whatever. It was kind of like. So I had to kind of re-edit it a bit to make it more like Fango friendly, you know, but it was like, but that was honestly like what I saw that day on set. They were doing like nothing, you know. So I was just looking at. At production design. Yeah. Were you um, were you developing any of the initial books at this point in your life? I mean, like the Luciano Rossi book, or I, th I think there was one that you never actually turned into a book on um, the de de camera. De oh, the camera Yeah. Yeah. So when I was in university, I was in university for medieval studies, and I never finished because I mean, partially because they just stopped offering a lot of the courses that I needed and like the higher level courses. And so at a certain point, my one of the teachers suggested I do an independent study that I just I just get a full year of credits 
for like this one epic paper that I would write. And so I proposed to write it about the Italian decamerotics, which are like sex comedies based on the decameron. And, uh, and so at the time, um, it, was, it was the longest piece in English about these movies, you know. And so Harvey Fenton at Fab Press published it in Flesh and Blood Book 2, and I think that was the first thing I had published, like in a book. It was that. Uh, and then, and then Fab ended up printing my Luciano Rossi book in like 2007, uh, which was a very unlikely. It's kind of funny because like nobody bought it; it went into the remainders. But now people, everybody knows who Luciano Rossi is now. So now you want it? It's like sorry, they're, they've all been pulped. You know. <laughs> Your dad tells you happily that he found it in a bargain bin, and you were <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, my dad was all excited because he's like, wow, you're like a real author. I found your book in a bargain bin. I was like, Dad. I was like, you don't tell people when you find your book in a bargain bin. What, what prompted the Lucio, Luciano Rossi book? Because he's not that well-known an actor then. And so this would have been, I mean, very much speaking to your obsessions. Oh, yeah. No, it was just like lust. Yeah. <laughs> like, I had a lustful interest in Luciano Rossi, and so I made this book that was basically just me reviewing every single role that he had, and <laughs> reviewing the films with, like, stars for how much screen time he had. Not for, nothing was about, like, how good the movie was. There was no rating for how good the movie was. It was, like, stars for how much screen time he had, and then, like, hearts for how good his hair was. <laughs> When I interviewed you, you told me a story about Rico Boido that made me laugh out loud every time I've heard my podcast back since. Can you tell me again a Rico Boido story? Well, when I was doing the Rossi book, um, I wanted somebody to be able to, you know, obviously I was trying to find people who knew him, you know, to talk about him. And it was very difficult because very weirdly nobody remembered him. It was very hard to find other actors he'd worked with who remembered him. And that was a bit sad. Um, but one of the actors that he was paired with a few times was this guy named Rico Boido. So they had been paired in some westerns, um, and uh, I'm trying to remember if they were also in crime films, but but definitely like westerns. You know, they'd been in together. And um, so I got a hold of him through, I think it was like somebody that was doing a book or somebody was doing a movie about like diabolical super criminal movies, like a documentary. And they had interviewed Rico Boido for that because, you know, when they had done, like, the Fumetti comics of, um, of some of these, like, super criminal stories where they would, you know, they're, like, photo comics or whatever. And so they would have actors to, like, play the characters and have the bubbles and stuff like that. And so Rico Boido had been a model for many of these types of books. And so he, ended up, he was interviewed in that documentary. So I contacted that guy. And... I remember at first he didn't want to give me the contact, so I gave him like $500 or something for him to connect me to Rico Boido. But I also had to pay Rico Boido $500, so I paid like $1,000 in total to try to get a hold of Rico Boido to see if he would do a intro, like a little introduction for my Rossi book, which he did. Um, but so he lived in this town outside of Rome called Ostia, which was the town where also Pasolini was yeah. killed. And uh, so he lived in this beach town, and I decide I'm going to go there and I'm going to interview him. So I'm like, I get on a plane, I go to Italy, and then as soon as I land, and they make the announcement on the plane in Italian, and I realize I don't speak Italian. <laughs> How am I going to do this interview? And but it was literally, it did not occur to me until we landed and they spoke in Italian on the announcement. But I was just like, oh, I don't speak Italian, and now I'm in a country where everybody speaks Italian. And I'm like, like, what am I doing? And so I ended up making it somehow to the campground I had booked in Austria. I had booked a place with a little cabin. But I had to call Rico Boido's phone number. I had to call him. So I had to get the people who worked at the front desk of the cabin to call him. And so I had no idea what they were saying. But they were. But then they said to me, okay, he's going to come here. He's going to be here in 20 minutes. And I was like, wow, okay. Uh, and they said, but I will translate for you. you know. And I'm like, okay, great. So then I like, sat down with Rico Boido. And he arrived. And he looked almost exactly the same, honestly. You know, He has these piercing blue eyes and blonde hair. I mean, he looked just like an older version. and uh, But he was wearing literally five 
fanny packs. <laughs> so he had like five fanny packs on. And so then throughout the like interview, he would constantly be pulling pictures out of the fanny pack to show me like articles about himself and like pictures of himself like in a movie with Al Pacino or whatever. And I would just be like, that is not you in that picture with Al Pacino. And he's like, yes, yes, it's me. And I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> and so it was just, it was so weird. Like he just was convinced that like, He's, he was, you know, he showed me a picture of Klaus Kinski, and he's just like, oh, here's me in this movie, and I'm like, that is a picture of Klaus Kinski. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I asked him, I was like, okay, so what happened with the, you know, like, how come you weren't in any of the Jallo films, you know, you like did all these westerns, and then when things kind of switched to Jallo, you, you know, where did you go? You went, weren't in these films. He's like, yes, I'm in these films. And I'm like, I'm like thinking, okay, he doesn't understand what I mean by Jallo. So I said, you know, I'm thinking of like Cat of Nine Tails. He's like, yes, I'm in this movie. And I'm like, who are you in the movie? He's like, I'm the killer. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you're not. And so it was just the weirdest interview I ever had because he just was like constantly pulling out these pictures and swearing that these were pictures of him and all these like bigger movies than any of the movies he did and it was yeah it was just so weird and then he tells me that he was best friends with Sharon Tate and that he wrote a book about her and that he had brought a copy of this book to give to me and so there's this book it's called Pigs and it's got a crudely drawn cover of a woman's hands like her nails scratching down a wall and like blood dripping and then it says like pigs and like bloody letters and the whole book is in Italian so I can't read it um, but he's like yes this is my tribute to my best friend <laughs> and I'm just you know so so I just kept thinking okay I can never use this interview until he's dead which he is now so I may use it for somebody <laughs> But it's just like, it was just like, this is the craziest interview I've ever done. You know, I mean, it was kind of like when Mitch did the interview with Al Festa of, of oh God, Fatal yeah. Frames. It was like that kind of an interview, you know. And um, for anybody interested in that interview, it's in Flesh and Blood magazine. I don't know what don't issue, know issue, but, <laughs> but it's, it's equally funny. Um, but yeah, so, but he ended up writing the foreword for my Luciana Rossi book anyway. And uh, and he said very nice things about Luciana Rossi, so that was that was the important thing. I, I had to hear it again. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, tell me about Janice Specials and the origins of House of Psychotics. Um, well, a Janice Special is what my friend Sam would always call a movie where he would, you know, he he would see a movie and be like, "This is a Janice Special," you know, and, and he and he would say it was always a movie where some woman was crazy or having a breakdown or whatever. And um, and the customers at Black Dog would often say the same thing. They'd be like, every movie you recommend to me has some crazy woman in it. <laughs> and so then I just started thinking about how it was, uh, I was like, yeah, this is a thing. These are movies that I'm really drawn to over and over again. So that was when I first had the idea for the book. But it was originally just going to be a book of uh, essays of, you know, maybe 10 movies, and some of the essays I would take from cannibal culture that I'd already written, and then I would write a few new ones, and I'm thinking, and there you go, it's a book, it's easy. Um, but then, in the interim, the internet had kind of exploded, and there was a lot more writing about obscure films coming out on the internet, and I started to think that that proposed book wasn't interesting enough. You know, I was just sort of like, well, who really needs to read like my reviews of films if there's all this other great writing happening? And so I was like, I can't do this unless I'm gonna do something interesting with it. But I didn't know what that was gonna be. And so it was like a combination of friends, like uh, my friend Matthew Rankin and my friend Kaylin Battenstall were both encouraging me to write it from a personal perspective. And then my friend Chandra Mayer who is a writer based in Winnipeg, uh, gave me a copy of this book by Sandy Balfour called, and I can never remember the name of it because it's got a weird name that's like a cryptic crossword puzzle name. It's like, you know, girl eight in blah, 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 something, you know, with numbers. And, um, but he had written this book that was about his obsession with cryptic crossword puzzles, but it was all personal, like where it was like talking about his 
divorce and everything, but then he would go very deep into like the history of cryptic crossword puzzles, and it was like a history book, you know, but then it would kind of cut back and forth between his marriage breaking down or whatever and all these like personal things and my friend Chandra gave it to me because she's like I don't think you'll necessarily like like this book for the kind of book it is but she's like I thought the structure could help you because you were struggling with like how to do the um you know how to blend like the personal with like historical information or whatever you know and uh and so that helped a lot like I mean I don't think it's exactly the same structure but it definitely helped me figure out how to like weave the things together we didn't talk about celluloid horror in Ashley Fester's book on or, uh, documentary rather on Sem Muerte and about you but and I know you had mixed feelings about it for a while yeah um but I mean your story was compelling enough that this filmmaker saw a movie in you you know in, in your story I mean were you self-conscious about being that open when you started yes. writing it? <laughs> oh, when I started writing? Well, when you start writing, I mean, do you think, because like, well, clearly I, my life is interesting enough that like there's a movie that you know is partly focused on me and my story. I mean, mm -hmm. is it, do, do you feel like oh, maybe there's interest for strangers to read about my no. life? No, it did, I didn't make the connection from one to the other. It was not like, oh, well, you know, if there's the movie, there should be a book too or whatever. It was yeah. nothing like that. It was like, I actually, that movie, Celluloid Horror, was originally supposed to be a six minute promotional reel that I could use to promote my festival and actually just kept filming me for like two years. <laughs> so, and it became a movie. I guess it's not that much different from how my folk horror movie got made. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, so it was like, and it was very weird because she had footage of my wedding in it, you know, that she had gotten covertly and stuff, you know. Um, but uh, the, yeah, so I wasn't thinking of that at all when I did the book, but the, but the only way it came up was sort of when I was doing the introduction to the book, I acknowledged it, you know, I acknowledged that she had done this work that kind of touched on personal stuff for me that I was very uncomfortable with at the time. Um, but that, uh, you know, but that here I am kind of doing the same thing. I'm like, I'm, you know, getting into this personal terrain and that I had to realize after watching her film that these things are still worth documenting, you know. Did you keep a diary or do you keep a diary? No. Okay. Is that, how did, was, it, was it hard to draw the old memories or was it all as clear as it seems to be? The, the oldest memories are very clear. Like all the childhood stuff is, I mean, yeah, all the childhood stuff and a lot of the teenage stuff is are very clear memories. Things get more muddy actually as I get older and I don't remember them, so. Did, did you have any early version that was just the film analysis or did it always interweave your there was never like a version of it in, that was complete in any other version, you know, like there were stops and starts along the way, but um, it wasn't like I wrote the book one way and then went back and changed it, you know, it was just sort of like I would write a little bit and then be like, eh, you know, I'd lose interest and then go back to it a bit later when I would get inspired by something. And so it was like a 10 year process from beginning to end. This is jumping ahead a little bit, but how do you, I mean, when you go back to it now, because we're, you know, we're, you know, on the eve of the relaunching of the new, the new edition of it. I mean, how does it, how do, how do you feel like you've changed as a writer? I mean, does it, does it make you uncomfortable to look back at it, or do you feel? I don't look back at it at all. I have not looked at the, I've not looked at the book or read it since it came out. Um, I didn't look at it when I, you know, when I was preparing the new edition, which was basically just expanding the appendix, I didn't want to look at my writing in the book because I just knew that I would be tempted to change it. If I did, so I definitely like flipped through when I would be looking for certain things, but so there are a few things I came across, like you know my review of misery, where it's just like uh, I, I make fun of the movie for being like weak. I'm like, oh, it's like a weak movie, like it's for people who can't handle possession. And I just <laughs> like, oh, it's so that's so like pretentious. <laughs> um, and so I just know that I would I would have that cringe factor constantly if I looked through it, you know. Um, so I just tried to avoid, you know, changing it because I really thought it should just be a thing of its time. It's like I wrote this in 2012 when I was in a certain emotional space, and if I change it, then it changes that too. And I didn't want to change that. So um, I don't remember what your question was though. <laughs> well, I mean, do you? 
when you're writing like, the new forward to it or you're writing new material for it, I mean, do you feel more guarded now that you know that there's a large audience for it? Or that, yes. Yeah. I know that Tim, Tim Lucas alluded to the fact that you're not always happy that that book is so personal and so out there. Yeah, well, that was because I it didn't. Occur. I mean, for one thing, when you write when when you write any book, I think you, like or at least me, I like I don't expect anyone to actually read it. Like I just thought like it's gonna come out and it'll be there and I'll be proud that I made something. But like no one's really gonna read it except my friends or whatever, you know. And so I think like the amount of people who read it definitely opened up myself to people more than I thought would happen. And then also, um, there definitely has been instances where I feel as though people use things in the book uh, to manipulate me and stuff, you know? So, uh, so, that, so that has definitely created a guardedness in me more. Yeah, I mean, I met you when you came to Philadelphia on the book tour for that in, in 2012, I think. I mean, had you ever gone on a book tour before? I mean, I assume that Lucio Luciana Rossi book was a little bit more niche. Did you ever yeah. go on a tour? I didn't do a book tour for Luciana Rossi, but I think I did go to an event that Fab Press put on in the UK at some point. Like they just did some kind of weekend where they played a bunch of movies related to books that they had done. And so I was there for that. I don't think they even played a Luciana Rossi movie, but he just had me there to sign books anyway. Um, but that was it. That book did nothing, you know, so there was nothing around it. And I also didn't know really at that time. Uh, actually, you know, I did a book launch in Winnipeg, and yeah, so maybe I did like two or three things with it, but. Um, was the impact on your life immediate? I mean, when it came out, I mean, as far as programmers doing retrospectives of films covered in the book? I mean, of House of Psychotic Films? Yeah. I would say, yes, yeah, so in terms of programmers, yes, I was contacted by programmers like pretty early on after it came out wanting to do retrospectives around the book, um, but I, it didn't get a lot of like traditional press or coverage, you know, like it didn't get a lot of like book, you know, like book reviewers like didn't touch it, you know, there's like this whole like side of, of like the press that covers books and literature and stuff, and the book wasn't touched by any of those people, you know, so it was literally only like horror press that wrote about it. But the programming was much more, I feel like that was much more impactful in terms of like getting word about the book out there, was more the programmers who picked it up and made programming around it than the articles and stuff. But um, yeah, so there were, uh, retrospectives starting right away and they went on for a couple of years there was like a huge art exhibit in in Portugal based on it there was like you know there, it was interesting it was really interesting to me you know that people were inspired by it to do things you know yeah I mean I've interviewed plenty of people that have commented on it I've talked to filmmakers that say um, one younger filmmaker uh, Tabana Garvey who you've worked with on the, the reference side said that, that inspired him to make films more than any film that book was what made her want to because of your bravery talking about mental illness and she identified with it to the point where she felt like it was hard to make her first film because of that book. Right. And I know a lot of people that, I mean, I know Alexander Helen Nicholas told me that she felt like that was the men, women, and chainsaws of our generation. And I, I agree with that. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, did people start writing you personally? I mean, as far as like what your book uh, revealed to them about their own personnel, personalities, personal life? I would say, yeah, people did start to write to me and they, you know, like nobody would like step overboard or like go crazy on me or anything like that, but it was more, but people would write me and just say like they appreciated it and that it helped them through something in their own life or, or even just like that they hadn't thought of the fact that they also relate to movies the same way. They're like, you know, reading the book made me realize that I also look at movies autobiographically and that I also that it totally affects how I view the movie and how I relate to the characters and everything if I'm actually going through, you know, the same thing. And then I realized, like, actually, yeah, everybody who looks at movies like that, I think, you know, like, everybody has, uh, is going to relate to a movie more, it's going to have more resonance with them if they feel like there's, you know, some connection with what the character is going through, you know? It was just like, in my, and, and you know, in my case, a lot of times I was like, I would use the movies as, an example of bad behavior, you know, like I have a tendency to get angry very quickly, 
to, um, I have a rage problem, I have um, a jealousy problem, I have like a lot of issues. <laughs> and, um, and I feel like when you see other people acting like that, you're like, oh man, you know, like you're crazy. You know? <laughs> and it helps you to not be like that. If you can see what you look like to other people when you're acting like that, and it's like when you watch these movies, it's like you can see that in a way. It's like seeing yourself from the outside when you're, when you're having a fit or you're like overreacting to something or whatever. And that's not to say all the women in the book are overreacting. I actually think a lot of the women in the book are reacting. That was the hardest thing about doing the new book, was like picking movies to go in it. I felt like none of these women are crazy. They're actually just reacting normally. <laughs> you know, they're actually reacting normally to situations where they've been wronged or whatever. You know, like, I mean, so it was actually harder to think of them as, like, crazy women. Because I'm like, that's just a normal reaction, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you, I think you wrote, was it like a hundred you for this new edition, something like that? Yeah. And did you notice after 2012, the Janice specials of, of cinema, do they feel like, can you, can you tell how many filmmakers are, have read your book is what I guess, I guess I'm asking? I mean, can you feel your influence and in what you've pointed out in talking about films like The Entity or Possession, or Let's Get Jessica to Death, or Mafu Cage, all these films that got renewed attention, Haunting of Julia. Um, did you feel like, could you feel your influence on the films that you're reviewing? I mean, there was definitely, one thing I can say for sure is between 2012 and now, there have been probably double the amount of films that would fit this category or subgenre or whatever, as there was in all of cinema leading up to 2012. Mm -hmm. You know, like there have been so many in the last decade, and so I don't know what you want to say about that, but that is the decade that, since I wrote my book, you know, and I do think that, like, for a lot of people told me that it, it um, made them think of movies together that they hadn't thought of together, like movies being in the same conversation or being, like, the same subgenre, like movies they hadn't thought of as being connected in any way, and they realized that they also really respond strongly to those films, but it was just that the book um, made a category for them in a way, you know, like, so it was like something people already kind of knew and they already liked those films, but the book just made this like handy umbrella for them to all go under so that filmmakers could be like, I want to make that type of film, you know, the same as like when I made the folk horror documentary, I mean, the folk, the term, the term folk horror and how it got used had a very similar function, you know, where people started to want to make a folk horror film because now they understood what that meant. Now, I knew that there was a, a television show that you had been developing rope films. Is that still something that you hope to do? I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of sick of thinking of it now because we pitched it at Frontiers and it was picked up by a couple of companies that sat on it for a while. And, uh, and then I feel like when we first pitched it, there were a lot of really original ideas in it in terms of like how we wanted to structure it with the sort of female interiority and the sort of reality of the everyday that the character is in. Um, and I feel like at the time, a lot of people we pitched it to were having a very hard time imagining what we're talking about. Like, how, how does this look? What is, and then I feel like since then, there's actually been so many shows that do that, that go into that terrain, that I feel like if we did the show now, it would just seem derivative of those other shows. Changing topics, but can we talk about Miskatonic uh, Institute of Horror Studies? And can you talk to me about the origins of that project and what it was uh, like? What inspired it? Mm, it so I was living in Winnipeg and I was doing a artist or a writer in residency at a store called Aqua Books, and they had like a whole second floor where they had all these like you know artist studio spaces, and they had this kind of big room that was like a uh, an event room, you know, and it was it was a really cool space. And um, so they had this program and they said, okay, everybody has to do something as part of them being a writer in residence or whatever, like some reading or some whatever. And, uh, and it was actually the guy who owned the store that suggested that I do a workshop, like a horror workshop for teens. Because he was like, you know, all the, during spring break, all the little kids have like so much programming and stuff created for them to do and the, and the sort of 
young teens, like the 14 year olds or whatever, have nothing, you know, like, so that whole week, it's like, there's not really a lot of programming happening for that age group, so why don't you do, like, some kind of horror workshop, and so, it was very funny, because I had not taught anything to anyone before, or <laughs> tried to, like, explain concepts to people, and so, I totally, like, overdid it in terms of, like, I printed out so many examples of, like, scholarly writing. Like, I decided to focus it on, like, writing about horror, you know? So it was about horror film, like, criticism, and I was talking about, like, a whole history of, like, all these, like, fanzines and all these, like, scholars and stuff like that, you know? So it was, like, I photocopied so much stuff for them to read, and they were just, like, you know, couldn't be bothered to, like, do all these readings. Um, and, uh, yeah, but it was, like, every day we would watch a film, and then, because it was, like, the full day, you know, for the whole week, it was, like, a five-day workshop or whatever, so we'd watch a film, and then we'd, like, talk about it afterwards and stuff, and, uh, it was kind of, like, I guess they liked it, but I don't know, because it was, to me, it was just so weird, I was, like, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm just, like, I don't know how to teach a class or anything, but then I got asked by some other organization, oh, we heard you did this workshop for kids, like, can you come do it at our place? And that place was even crazier because it was like, um, the kids at that place were all, it was like an after school place in like a rough neighborhood. And the kids were definitely not interested in like reading anything. Or, you know, the first day I played the movie The Haunting of Julia, <laughs> And they were just like, what is this movie? It's so bad, you can't see anything. It's <laughs> and uh, so, so I had something else planned for the next day where I was going to be playing something like Frankenstein, the true story or something. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I'm in trouble. I was like, they're not going to, you know, they're not into these movies at all. And then I think I, I decided to just play Stuck, the Stuart Gordon movie. <laughs> so all these kids, I mean, they're like 11 and stuff, you know, but they're like rough smoking kids, you know. <laughs> And uh, so I'm like, okay, Hunting of Julia is just too delicate of a movie for these kids, you know? So then I, like, put on Stuck, and they're just like, yeah! You know, they're just, like, like railing at the screen. They loved it. They're like, they're, yeah, totally. And it sa saved me. You know, I actually emailed Stuart Gordon after, and I was like, thank you for saving me from these dangerous children. Because <laughs> I was like, I thought they were going to kill me after the first day, making them watch such a boring movie, you know? And, uh, but yeah, the second, so the second day was great, because we watched Stuck, and then we just talked about, like, I just let them talk about, like, what they liked about it, and whether or not they thought it had, because it's not, you know, it's not any kind of traditional horror movie or anything like that, but it was like, them just talking about what they think a horror movie is, and what you have to have in it, and whatever, and so they just riffed on that, and, and then it turned out great, but, um, but so then the bookstore, it, it was really not even my, you know, like everything. It was like an accident. Like I accidentally started the school. So then I got my friend Kaylin Battenstall, who wrote a book about Canadian horror, to do a class about Canadian horror, except that everybody who came to his class was all adults. They were all like 40 years old. Because I guess we hadn't made it clear enough. It was like for teenagers. So Kaylin was totally intimidated because he had prepared a class for like, teenagers who don't know anything about these movies, and then, like, all the people who came were, like, hardcore horror fans, you know, <laughs> that, like, wanted, you know, take a horror class, and he was just like, oh, shit, I did not prepare a class for, like, adults, um, but, you know, he did it, and that was really the beginning of it, you know, was just realizing that, okay, so I did the first couple myself, but I'm not very good at it, but I also do know a lot of other people that, like, have this expertise, and maybe I can get some of those people to, like, do some classes, you know? And so as soon as I started thinking about the idea of, like, having other people, like, come in and do classes, um, that was when things got interesting to me, you know? Because it was very shambolic and haphazard when I was doing it myself. And so when, we, when I moved to Montreal here was when it actually got established as an actual, like, weekly thing, you know? And Ariel Hare, I don't think he's here because he had to introduce a movie. Ariel, who is a programmer here at Fantasia, how I met him was that he came to the Miskatonic classes. He was the youngest kid that came to the, he was not 18 yet, and uh, he was the youngest kid that came to the Miskatonic classes here in Montreal. And that was the, the beginning of like his career in film. Tell me, like, how many locations host these classes now? Because this spread all over the place in, in the years that followed. Yeah, so it was, it started here in Montreal, 
And then I moved out of Montreal, so I left the Montreal branch with uh, Christopher Woofter and Mario De Giglio Belmar. I moved, uh, I was living in London, and my friend Virginie Salavi um, lived there, and she was a scholar, you know, and so I just said, said uh, you know, would you be into doing a, a London branch? And so she started doing that one, and then eventually there was a New York one, which I originally did with Mark Balkow. Uh, and then Joe Yannick was running it with Jacqueline Castell. I mean, so some of the people have changed over time, you know, but then it, it expanded to L.A. when I first moved out there. And so now it's in Los Angeles, New York, and London. The Montreal one is not here anymore because Chris and Mario ended up doing their own uh, thing called Monstrum, which is, a, uh, which is also a, a similar scholarly in, endeavor, but one that's like their own. And, um, but yeah, so it's like in three cities. And I ran it from 2010 to the till January 2021 when I passed it over to Dr. Sheila Rowan Legg, um, who was a film programmer, a scholar, a writer, a uh, filmmaker. Um, and so I'm still on the board, you know, like the advisory board or whatever. Uh, but Sheila runs it now since 2021. Can you talk to me about Spectacular Optical? And when did you get the idea of having a small press? Was that something that you wanted to do from the days that you first started developing your own books, or is it something that came about more recently than that? No, I, that was also an accident. So it was like, uh, Spectacular Optical started actually, uh, the website started as Fantasia's magazine. It was like Fantasia's like journal, because they wanted to try to figure out a way to have um, more of a presence year round, you know, as opposed to everything being focused on the one event. They were like, how do we keep people engaged all year? And I think I proposed that, you know, we do a website that's kind of like a journal where it's like every month there's like a new issue with new articles and stuff like that. And I voted to call it Spectacular Optical for obvious reasons. And, um, and so that ran as the Fantasia magazine or whatever for, I think, two years. And then, um, it wasn't really having the desired effect because it was actually having more, there was more people interested in it overseas than there were like right here in Montreal. And the whole point of Fantasia funding it was they wanted it to turn into like ticket buyers, you know, like, so if it wasn't having that effect, it was really hard to justify like keeping paying for it. But then Pierre who runs Fantasia said, you know, you, you made the website, you named the website. He's like, if you want this website, well, I'll just give it to you, you know, and you can do what you want with it. And so he gave it to me, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do with it because I didn't have, because um, I also didn't have money to be making a regular magazine. And so I started looking into grants to see if there was any magazine uh, or like online magazine type of grants that I could apply for. And so when I started looking through the grants, I realized that it was actually way easier to get a grant for a book publisher than an online magazine, you know, like the actual or even a print magazine, you know, it was like for a book publisher, the amount of like pages you had to have, the amount of just everything was just like, there was just way less requirements that you had to meet. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a book publisher then <laughs> and see if I can get the grant. I never got any grants because, um, yeah, like typically the, they just see a lot, of, a lot of the stuff I do is just in this weird zone where it's like too popular for, the grant people and not popular enough for it to make money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like in this gray zone, you know, where it's considered like too populist to be worthy of like a grant, you know, like they want to fund just different stuff. And so, uh, so I never got a grant for it, but that was how it started was I was just thinking, oh, I'll get a grant and, and then I can do it as a book thing. And, um, so the first book was like Kid Power, which is why the Kid Power book is very much structured like a journal or something. You know, it's it's uh, it's a bit more of a hodgepodge than almost any of the other books that we did. Like all the other books feel, I think, a lot more curated in their, you know, direction and things complementing each other. Whereas Kid Power was kind of like people just wrote about whatever they wanted that had to do with child empowerment. You know. I was going to ask you, what role nostalgia? A lot of the things that come in the wake of the House of Psychotic Women, I think of Kid Power, think of the book that wound up morphing into a podcast, The Heart, a song from The Heart Piece of Devil Every Time. I think about even the Satanic Panic, and uh, certainly uh, even, I don't know if it's a stretch to say, 
folk horror documentary has an element of, of that because I know that you, you know, studied medieval you know, history in school. I don't know if there was any kind of uh, connection, like in terms of, I know, Wicker Man was your first location visit. But I mean, yeah. when you look back on all the projects, I mean, so many of them seem to resonate with you know, your coming of age years. I mean, is that something mm -hmm. that you are conscious or self conscious about, or is it just? what you're naturally obsessed with that enough to make it a reality. I think I definitely have an obsession with that period of my life because I never got to have like a normal one, yeah. you know? And so I always look back at like what I always thought childhood was supposed to be like or what I thought being a teenager was supposed to be like, you know, like I was in foster homes and I was in a, like on my 16th birthday, I always thought I would get a car, you know? And instead I was put in reform school. <laughs> and. Um, you know, so I didn't have a lot of the same experiences that a lot of the other teenage kids had, and I, you know, my aesthetics have never kind of changed from that, that time in the late 70s. Like, I always wanted feathered hair, you know, like, I always wanted, like, fair faucet hair or something like this. My mom would never let, she never liked me having long hair, so she would always cut it short and stuff. And, uh... You know, but my hair did feather really well when I was <laughs> I just didn't have, like, long enough hair to really flaunt it. And so, um, but I always wanted that. And because my mom would never just let me have that hair, I became obsessed with it, you know. And so that whole aesthetic of, like, what people looked like then, like, in the late 70s or whatever, to me, that's, like, what people are supposed to look like, you know. And, like, the movies that came out at that time, like, just things, like, where everybody has a best friend, you know, in these movies. They have, like, some best friend. And so I always wanted a best friend. And I was like, why can't I have a best friend? And then I realized that, you know, it's because it would be like heavenly creatures if I had a best friend. <laughs> so it's like probably good I never had a best friend. But, you know, but, but I just always had this, like, feeling like I never got to have it the way I wanted it. And so, I mean, I'm sure that's the same for most people who are nostalgic. That's like they're always going back to try to fix it, you know? I was thinking about that, like listening to, and I'll, I'll say it again, everyone should download her podcast, uh, Song from the Heart, please download every time, it's amazing. But I was listening to the Devil and Daniel Mouse episode of it, and uh, you talk about the, the value system that you learned from that, as far as not selling out, and uh, integrity, and honesty, and sincerity. Yeah. And I, you know, I think about that with a lot of your work, it's like there's no irony with any of it. Like this, it's all sincere love. I, I, I it's really a question, but yeah. it's an observation. But, uh. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I don't know how many people here, I mean, we're in Canada, so I'm assuming that many people here probably saw the Nelvana Halloween special, The Devil and Daniel Mouse, when you were kids, okay, some people. But that was, you know, it was an early influence on me. It was like a Halloween cartoon about a folk singing duo, these two mice, and uh, they're falling on hard times, and the girl sells her soul to the devil to become a rock star. And, uh, you know, so there's all this great music and everything. It's like, it's like uh, John Sebastian and, and um, Valerie Carter. And, uh, and the whole message of the whole thing is about, um, you know, not, not selling out. And, like, being loyal to your friends, you know, and all this stuff. And, and, uh, and so the whole concept of, like, what it meant to, like, sell out was something I thought about from a very young age, you know, like... And, um, and it's something I feel has like guided a lot of my work, which is why a lot of times I do stuff that, at least when I first do it, usually no one is interested in it. You know, like people later might be interested in it, but often they're not at first. And usually that's because I'm doing them for myself. You know, like I'm not guided by what will people like or whatever, you know? Like when I had my Cinema Muerte Festival, I invited Jack Taylor as a guest. Like Jack Taylor, who was like in, you know, Jess Franco movies and stuff. Literally no one there had any idea who he was at the festival, you know? Um, but to me, it was like, if I'm gonna spend my money and I get to pick who I wanna hang out with, I'm gonna pick Jack Taylor, you know? And I still am friends with Jack Taylor. Like I just saw him in person, like, I don't know, a few months ago. So. Um, yeah, so it's like, it's, it's like I've always felt like, and then years ago I used to book uh, bands to play at this, uh, at this record store. Like, I would book the events. And so, the, that was like one time when I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to go, be more broad than my own taste. I'm gonna try to think of like, what other people's taste is, and you know, I can't just pick bands I would like, you know. 
And so I would pick a band that I, you know, thought had like good sales and blah blah blah, and, and I would book them, and nobody would come, and then it would just be me sitting there listening to a shitty band I didn't like. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, no, this is no good because it's like at least if no one comes, you want it to be at the band you like. <laughs> you know? so, so it's like always just do what you. It is your instinct that you think is good, you know? It's like you can't win if you try to do things other people like, you know? Um, and I feel like that's been a thing, you know, throughout everything I've done. Well, tell me about, I mean, in the years following House of Second Agreement, you get involved in a lot of different programming ventures, you get involved in different books through Spectacular Optical, uh, you develop a few books that are probably in various stages of completion, Cockfighter book and the uh, heart uh, song from the heart beats the devil every time. I mean, were you looking to cleanse your palate after having to talk about crazy women in horror for like X number of years? I mean, were you trying to mix it up for yourself just to keep? No, it's just that I naturally am interested in a bunch of different things, you know. So it's just sort of like that's also why like my jobs, like my, any job I've had, has changed a lot too, you know, like over the years because. Um, and that's why I never was always just a writer, or just a this, or just a that, because I often am like just interested in all different types of things, and so I'll just kind of like bounce around between them. So, how did you come to work for Severin? I think I was like here at Fantasia, and uh, I, you know, or maybe I was visiting David Gregory in LA, but we were just talking about like editing you know, featurettes, like what it takes and whatever, and I was just like, oh, I have like rudimentary editing skills, maybe I can edit a featurette sometimes. So he gave me a job editing a featurette. I think my very first one I had to do was for the Mondo Bizarro DVD, I had to do a, uh, like a little featurette about Bob Cressy. There was like two featurettes about Bob Cressy. So I edited those, and I think those were my first things I did for Severin. And so yeah, so I was originally hired just to kind of do editing, and it was very sporadic, you know. So the amount of work I did for them grew, obviously, over time. And also, as uh, David learned to trust me as, like, an employee and stuff, like, that I was, you know, going to have ideas that would be good for the company or whatever. And, um, but, yeah, it's <laughs> David Gregory is my boss. He's there, so I'm, like, talking about my boss while he's sitting there. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, no, it's, uh, and that's been honestly the most fruitful collaboration of my whole career, you know, is working at Severin, because it's the first time that somebody trusted me 100% to do things, you know, like, because often, that's the, the reason I've done so many of these projects on my own is not because I want to, it's because no one ever was willing to use their resources to support me doing those things, you know, so I have to do it myself, and so David is the first boss I ever had that like totally trusted me and would go along with my crazy ideas and like you know saw it as a benefit to the company to just let me be myself so yeah David Gregory <laughs> Your experience making uh, Tales of the Uncanny with him before you know you took on you know the uh, Woodlands Dark. I mean, was was that your first large scale documentary project? I mean, I know that you were a producer, one of the producers on Euro Crime for Matt Malloy. You had some other filmmaking experience just with the short things you had done as a programmer. But I mean, as far as like learning to make films, I mean, was that how important was that in your development? I would say, like, for Tales of the Uncanny, most of what I did was setting up interviews and doing interviews with, you know, like, D David and I had thought of, uh, for people who don't know, this is a documentary David Gregory made about uh, anthology horror films, and it was at the very beginning of COVID, and so, you know, he had the idea to, like, let's get a whole bunch of people on Zoom now that all these, like, directors and actors and everybody's stuck at home. And then, and so they're all going to be available. Yeah. And so, like, let's zoom with them and just ask people what their favorite anthology horror film is, what their favorite segment of an anthology horror film, and let's make a fun thing where we do like a poll at the end and we find out what if, you know what the majority of people picked or whatever. And some of the results were really surprising. But um, but that was really David's baby. I mean, all that all I did really was like 
you know, we would think of names together and then we would kind of split the jobs of, of interviewing them. But the actual, um, the editing was done by Mike Capone, who had done the um, Al Adamson documentary that David made. And, um, and so it was really like David and Mike working together to like make it actually come together and everything. So I was really just a, like a baby producer in the sense that I was just like doing interview stuff. So I was definitely like organizing things in that way, but it's but it was not the same, nearly the level of what I did for Woodland Stark and Days Bewitched. And same with like Mike Malloy with Eurocrime. Um, I got a producer credit on that because I liaised for like the first six people that he ended up getting in the cast just because I had either dealt with them at the Alamo Draft House or you know I had some connection to them. So the first like six people that he got, like Henry Silva, Joe D'Alessandro, John Saxon, um, he got them because of my connections, but then he was able to leverage that to then get a whole bunch of other interviews. And that was all I did on his, was like, I, I set up those first six contacts, and that was about it. And, and Woodland Star and Days Bewitched, I remember when you told me that, oh, yeah, I'm doing this really cool little featurette for the Blood on Saints Claw Blu ray. Mm -hmm. And like, this was, you know, you were excited about it because it was going to be kind of ambitious for a featurette, but then it just kept going and going. I remember like, you know, you're gonna have that done by the time that this comes out. I don't. I just. I gotta keep. It gets keep going and going. And then yeah. it's like I remember you told me like months. It's like three hours long now. And it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Talk, I mean, was it? At what point did it, it jump from being like a, a really good bonus feature into a substantial film? I mean, was it? Was it when you realized that it was gonna evolve beyond the British horror films, or was it earlier? Uh, well, it evolved into a feature fairly early on, just because, like, I think the Blood on, you know, we started it in the summer, the Blood on Satan's Claw disc was due in, like, November or something, and it definitely wasn't going to be done in time for November, but I think by that time, we already figured out, like, it was going to be a feature, because there was too much stuff, but yes, part of why that happened was because we decided to open it up beyond... Uh, British folk horror. Because that was originally all it was going to be, because it was going to be on the Blood on Satan's Claw disc, so the focus was very British, it was going to be about, you know, the relationship between that film and the sort of larger sphere of folk horror films in the, the UK in the 70s, so that was really the focus, and it was like, but when you, you interview people, a lot of times they end up saying interesting things that you hadn't thought of that just open this other window or something, you know, and that just kept happening every time I interviewed people, so it just kept, like, I kept going down these rabbit holes that were kind of suggested by people in the a rabbit hole, because isn't, isn't it, was it Robert Eggers said something about hairs only appearing in, uh, was it English folk horror, and then we had... Yeah, so Robert Eggers, when I was doing his interview, he was in the first batch of people we talked to, and he, you know, he talked about the hair in The Witch, and how, you know, they have all this mythology around hares in England. And he's like, oh, but in America we don't really have hares, but we do have jackrabbits in Native American mythology. And then he just continued on. So it was like a throwaway, like, aside to him. But that was it. That moment, it was like as soon as he said, like, oh, they do have jackrabbits in Native American mythology, that was literally the moment when I realized that the story was bigger than British. Mm -hmm. Did you have several like that over the course of it? Or was it something that, what if we can include this or include that? I mean, yeah. Was that intimidating because you realized that it was going to take that much more time? Or did, was that not? Was it yeah, not it was definitely intimidating because it was just like everything you read or anytime you interview somebody and they say stuff like that, you're just sort of like, oh, I'm really unprepared to do this. Like, <laughs> there's way more stuff I should be reading and considering, you know. And so we would go through uh, my editor. I had two editors, Ben Shern and, and Winnie Chung. They were both amazing. And uh, we would go through these things where, especially once Winnie started doing it, you know, I would um, have to sort of stop the edit and then just go read for two weeks because I'd realize, like, this is not gelling because there's some information missing here that should be here. Um, but I had to do a lot of research and reading just to even figure out who to ask or what to ask them, you know, to fill in that space. Yeah, because I, I, I feel like I might have heard you say this in an interview, but didn't you assemble a rough cut before, or, or rough scenes before bringing in these editors and 
was the feedback that you had arranged it like a book, like one of your books? Yeah, so I had done a rough cut and I was trying to find an editor and it was it was actually Mike Capone who had edited Children in Canny and uh, Blood and Flesh, the Al Adamson movie. Um, he was, I sent it to him uh, to consider for being an editor and he was too busy at the time, but he did give me the feedback that it was like a book. And then someone else ended up giving me the same comment, which was like Tyler Hubby was like another person that I was uh, considering getting for the as an editor, and um, and uh, and he said a similar thing. You know, like this is really structured the way you would structure like a book of essays or something, more than a movie. Like it's not, you know. And that's the thing. I didn't have a cinematic. Uh, I didn't have any experience like creating cinema. I only had experience like with the information. So it was like all the information was there, but it had to be made cinematic, and that was really what the editors. Did you know like Winnie and Ben brought in this like magic where it was like he would watch their first rough cuts of even like a little section and he'd be like oh my god this is like night and day from my rough cut my rough cut was just like you know this happened and then this happened and this you know it's just like it's like just talking there's no room for breathing it's just it's just information and then they just brought it to life where they made the movie feel like the information you know yeah I know that this was something that you had essentially pitched as well, you should have this to make this Blu-ray better, this this extra like bonus feature. This didn't come from years of obsession with folk horror, did it? Not necessarily. I mean obviously I was a Wicker Man fan from a you know from an early age because that was the first film location I visited and the Wicker Man you know the opening song from the Wicker Man was also the song that played when I got married. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And nobody knew except me and Anthony Timpson. You know, I, don't think, I don't think my husband even knew. It was like a horror movie theme that we were getting married to. But, um, but so, you know, so I was definitely a fan of certain folk horror films, but it was really more that, you know, I was trying to think of an interesting extra for this disc, something that wasn't on the British disc, you know, so that we would have, so Severin would have at least one thing that was like our, our own original thing. And, um, so, so it was really the fact that, you know, I knew I had read a lot about folk horror since 2011 or so, because it was really after, like, Kill List, um, when you started to see the term folk horror a lot in horror magazines and stuff like that. And so, um, so I had read a lot of these things, and I knew a lot of the people that were writing in this area, people like Adam Scoble, you know, and... Uh, so, so it was really just not so much that I was the expert as much as like, I know who the experts are. Like I know enough to know who the experts are. So I need to go to those people and we'll be able to get a really cool featurette out of it. So it was not coming out of my obsession. Um, I just thought it was a good idea and like kind of an obvious idea, you know. Do you think that that gave you some detachment that was helpful? I mean, as far as like it not coming from the same obsession, say if you had turned the bubble gum thing into mm -hmm. a film like this. I mean, it definitely helped it to be, I don't know, um, because it definitely got more, more and more personal as it went on. You know, like when I started it, it literally was just me trying to think of a cool thing to do for Severin. And then the more that I got into like the themes and the like, why? Why do we like folk horror? Why do we like it right now? You know, and, uh, and the more I started thinking about all that stuff, the more I started to feel especially because like at a certain point in the middle of making it, I moved to an island. I moved to like a remote island. And so I was like living in the woods. <laughs> and so everything just started to resonate with me in a different way, you know, and it felt much more personal. And so by the time it finished, it, it did feel like a very personal movie. Yeah, because I was thinking about how like House of Psychotic Women uh, it appeals to a lot of people that are not horror movie people. And yeah. I think about Woodland's Dark and Days Bewitched, and it's the same thing. I mean, horror movie fans love it because it's like all these great new films to add to the list of things to watch, but a lot of people love that movie that are not horror people. They like it because of the social political themes that you address, or the environmental things you address, or the folk folk elements. I mean, when you, when you sit down to make that movie, I mean, are you picturing any audience other than yourself and what you want to see in a film like that? I mean, do you think about, like, who it's reaching? I mean, the only thing I was really thinking about was two things, really. was, like, 
I don't want Adam Scoville to be embarrassed that he's in this movie. So it has to be good enough if he watches it that he's not going to be embarrassed. Um, and then also, I want, you know, so it's like I wanted to say something. I wanted to talk about, like, why, 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 why this, why that. You know, I don't want it to just be like, here is what is. I want it to be like, well, why? Um, but also, you know, so I wanted it to get, make sure to get into meaty things. But I also wanted people to have the shopping list. You know, it's like I also wanted people who were hardcore horror fans and had watched a lot of stuff to be able to be like, oh, I've never heard of that film. Or to, you know, have people be like, oh my God, there's so many films in this I never heard of, I gotta find these films, you know? So I knew that, because I do that with my books too, I try to make it both, where it's like you have the in-depth stuff, but then you'll often have, like in the Christmas book, or I've done, or whatever, like there will be the compendium that's a bit more comprehensive, you know, than the essays. And so it's like always trying to give people both, like give them something meaty, but also give them the kind of shopping list or the reference guide, you know. Well, I thought it was interesting how you intentionally omitted the people that were defining folk horror in like very direct way, like to make it more slippery. I didn't omit them, I just didn't have those, them well, that, saying that those things. That particular piece yeah. of writing. Yeah, but that was also because um, most of the people who had really specific <coughs> definitions for it were all coming from British scholarship. Yeah. And so I didn't feel right uh, just laying that on the movie, you know? Yeah. If I'm going to have an international movie and we're going to have all these international voices talking about what folk horror is to them and how it relates to their own culture and stuff, it just felt really wrong to like open the movie up by saying, here is what four out of five British men tell you before <laughs> is. So I just wanted to leave that open. Although I do regret not having Adam Scoville's folk horror chain. Like I took it out of there, out of the introduction, but I feel like I should have had it in the British section when I talk about like certain signposts, you know, because it's like Adam Scoville's theory of the folk horror chain was just as important as like Jonathan Rigby and Mark Gaddis talking about folk horror in the history of horror, a television show. You know, like it was a signpost, you know, and it should have been in that section. And so it was like I took it out of the introduction, but I should have just moved it. I shouldn't have cut it, you know, so I do regret that. But And you were making this during the pandemic too. I mean how how did that affect filmmaking? I mean did you have to eventually stop filming? interviews the way that you had started? I mean, was it, because it comes right as COVID-19 yeah. breaks. Yeah, I mean, we had, there were definitely people who weren't in the film because we couldn't film them live. Um, and then, you know, because because I tried to do one on Zoom, you know, Ian Cooper is is interviewed on Zoom and, and I just didn't like how it looked and sounded, you know, so there's that one interview that's on Zoom, but I just didn't want to keep doing other ones like that. Um, I hoped that what he had to say was interesting enough that people would overlook the fact that it was on Zoom, but I also didn't want to do the whole thing like that. So I ended up just not, I just ended up being like, okay, well, COVID is, is stopping us from interviewing people, so we just got to go with what we have, which was good because we were trying to get it into South by Southwest, and that deadline was coming, so like we had to finish it. Was the length ever a conversation as far as festivals? I mean, obviously it's not as big a deal when it's on streaming or on Blu-ray, but I mean, as far as like showing in a theater, I mean, was that ever something that you had conversations about? Well, well, you know, David would bring up the fact that, you know, you have to know that if the movie is this long, that a lot of festivals aren't gonna play it, you know? But he's like, but I don't care if you don't care. You know, he's just like, if you're fine with that, then so am I. You know, so he never put any restrictions on me about how long it could be, because we're like, well, we're a we're a home video company, so we, it could be like 10 hours long if you want. You know, it's like, because ultimately we're gonna make it on a Blu-ray, and so that doesn't matter, but he was like, but if it matters to you to be in film festivals, you might want to consider the length. Um, but luckily, the, the fact that festivals were all online that year, actually helped because then they were the same. They were just like, well, it doesn't matter how long it is because we're not paying to rent a theater to play the movie in. If they were renting a theater, they would have to use up two slots for my one movie. And so that's double the cost of theater rental for my one movie, whereas the fact that it's streaming online, that limitation isn't there. So it got programmed at way more festivals than it would have because of that. 
did the Blu-ray box set, was that something that was always, always built into the overall project once it separated off, or was that something that maybe the success of the film triggered? I mean, how, how, did, how did it become part of a larger set like that? Uh, well, I think like once we started working on the international section of the movie and David was seeing the titles and had the he's like, oh, what's that movie? What's that movie? And then it was like, I think he's like, you know, we should just, we should see if we can release some of these movies. And so that's kind of what it came from, was just like, you know, when we would have movies that David hadn't heard of, he would get excited about that possibility. And so that was so, so we did actually start uh, licensing things and working on the folk horror box set, like like collecting things for it while the film was still being edited. Because I was looking at you know, uh, the uh, House of Psychotic Women box set that is up for pre-order too, and it's like, uh, it feels like a, a side of your curation, you know, kind of, carrying over to home video, is that something that you see increasing as far as your role you know, in home video, as far as uh, these kind of sets, these kind of comprehensive looks at genre? I mean, it really just depends on if there's something to tie it into, you know, honestly, because it's like you can release, you can have the best taste in the world, but just like putting a movie out isn't, that's not enough for people to buy it, you know, so it's like, it really does depend on it having like a hook of some sort. And so, obviously, with the House of Psychotic Women said, the book is the hook. Yeah. That rhymes. <laughs> and then, uh, the uh, folk horror documentary was kind of the hook for the box set, you know, because then you know that people will take a chance on those movies because they've just seen a clip of it in the doc. Um, and so, yeah, so I know from doing programming, from doing all these things, that you still have, you know, if you're actually going to pay money to make stuff and put it out there, you know, it's expensive, and you don't want to, you don't want to do it and then be sad that you did it. You know, you want to be happy that you did it. So, you, so you really have to try to think of how you can position it the best way to be successful, so that you will also always love it and not be soured by it. You know. Has the experience of making Woodland Stark and Days Bewitched uh, triggered your interest in uh, further filmmaking efforts? I know this was kind of something that you kind of backed into and took charge of it, but is this, has this given you the confidence to start something intending it to be a feature from scratch? I mean, I think that I would definitely like to make at least one more, knowing what I know now and what I learned from the first time, you know, because the first time I feel like there's a lot of things I did backwards, and so I would like the opportunity to make another one just to see if I can do it better. Um, but I don't know that I want to be like a filmmaker yeah. in general. You know, like, I feel like I have too many interests to just do that, you know? Uh, and I definitely don't want to make films for other people. Like, I don't want to make films that, like, people come to me with their idea and they just want a director or something. Like, I have no interest in that. So it always has to be my own idea. Yeah. I guess, um, you know, the Cockfighter book is something I, I know that you've been working on for years. And I know that COVID kind of complicated your research process on it. Can we talk about that a little bit? I mean, what, what prompted you to... I think when I first talked to you about this, you had said that it was going to be um, a smaller book, kind of like the Luciano Rossi book, you know, after like these bigger projects. And I, I don't know if it's kind of grown into something bigger over time or if you just have been too busy with the things, like with the folk horse documentary. Yeah, no, I mean, I've been really been waylaid by other things, but it's like the, the Cockfighter book is ultimately supposed to not be much bigger than those kind of VFI monographs and stuff like that. It'll be a little bigger, but right now I have way more than that. You know, like right now I have a lot and I gotta whittle it down and then there's also other stuff I don't have yet that, that, that I wanna get. But ultimately, I don't expect people to read a, like endless book about cockfighter. You know, like I, I, like I, I do wanna get it to a sweet spot where people will actually read it, you know, and enjoy it and it has enough juicy information in it um, but I, but I don't want to make it like endless. Yeah, like, like I mean, okay, so like Stephen Bissett like has this epic book about the brood, but he is a researcher. He is an unparalleled researcher. I am not the researcher that he okay. is. You're not a researcher. I mean, come on. I'm not the researcher. He is. I mean, he's like he's another level. You know, he is a great researcher. And, uh, and I know just because like I've commissioned him to write stuff before and I've, my mind has been blown by the stuff he's turned up and the level of detail, you know. Um, but yeah, but for the Cockfighter book, I mean, part of why it's a bit longer than those monographs is because it really is not just about the movie, you know. It's about cockfighting 
also, and it's about uh, weird, um, well, not, I don't want to say weird, but it's about old ethics, you know, and old honor codes and stuff, you know, and like just all the stuff that like cockfighters believe justifies them to do the things they do, you know, and to have that as their business. Um, and there's a lot of really fascinating stuff there in terms of like what, you know, people's ideas of themselves and, and sort of closed systems of ethics and integrity and stuff where it's like inside this circle everybody feels really moral and ethical you know they have their own codes but outside of those circles it looks barbaric you know and it looks it's interpreted in a completely different way you know and there's just so much interesting stuff there and and Monty Hellman who made Cockfighter was honestly not as interested in cockfighting as I am you know <laughs> so uh, the cockfighting was always a, I think for him and the author, Charles Wilford, the cockfighting was always just an interesting backdrop for a story about a character, you know? Um, whereas for me, um, that was definitely my entryway to, cock, cock, to loving Cockfighter was that I love the fact that this character takes a vow of silence until he can win the Cockfighter of the Year award, and his, his struggle, his integrity issues are all about keeping a promise to himself, you know? And um, yeah, there's just there's just a lot I love about that character, but I also was like totally fascinated by the mechanics of the sport, you know, and um, and when I lived in Austin, Texas, it was still legal in Louisiana. It was the last state where it was legal, so I actually have gone to cockfights, you know, um, while I was researching the book and stuff, and um, it's. Yeah, you, you you go in there and it's just like all these people of different age groups, you know, it's like little kids and their grandparents and then all the wives that are painting, they're like hand painting fighting cocks on baseball hats, you know, and then they pass it to the next person, the next person has a blow dryer and they're drying it and they pass it to the next person, they put it on the rack, you know, it's like this assembly line of these like grandmothers that are like painting, uh, hand painting this merchandise and stuff. And... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just like a bizarre little world. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I, I don't know how much closer you are to the end of that. Is that something that we can expect the finished book next year? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I really need to finish that book. I mean, like, I had an Indiegogo for it, and the people are ready to kill me. <laughs> so, yeah, I really hope that I finish it soon. Um, but I don't know, I'm still chasing an elusive interviewee, um, and uh, and it's one of the only female characters in the movie, so I'm like desperate to get her interviewed. Um, but, you know, but at a certain point, it's like when I get to the point where everything else is finished except that, then I will have to just go forward without it. But as long as I'm still writing, I will keep trying to pursue her. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't see it coming out this year because I'm also working on editing a book about the films of Robert Downey Sr., and that looks much closer to being ready for this year. So that will probably, that will probably be the book I do this year, if any. What prompted that? Was, that? was that a director that you had a deep interest in for a long time, or is that something that you... It, not necessarily. I mean, like, I was, I was definitely interested in his films enough to want to read a book about them, and there wasn't one, yeah. you know? And it was like my friend Clint Enns, um, who is a filmmaker and a scholar or whatever, he kind of had the same thing, where he's like really interested in this guy's films, but you can't, there's, there's not, uh, there was no book about him, and it seemed really weird that there wasn't. Yeah, I remember you telling me once that you hated writing, but that when you wanted to read things that didn't, that didn't exist, you had to do it yourself. Yeah. So that you could it. Yeah, yeah. basically. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I mean, uh, but it's actually been the hardest anthology book we've had to do because we found that most people we contact have the exact same thing to say, where they're just like, I'm really interested in his stuff, but I just, I don't know anything about him or whatever, you know, like, uh, and it, yeah, it was just like a lot of people found it hard to approach his work because they weren't sure how to, like, how to interpret his humor you know, and how to interpret his politics and stuff, you know, because he's such a kind of trickster character almost, you know? And um, so, yeah, so it was not like there was just this, like, 
all these Robert Downey Sr. experts, and we could just pick them all, and they'll write chapters for the book. It was like, um, it's been way, a way more complicated process than that, but yeah, we're almost done that one. And I know that's important, too, to have the subject matter expert, to just not have someone try to become that, but to actually go to the real authorities on these kinds of projects. Right, and that actually was not possible with this one, you know, so I mean, the and people we ended up going to, normally my first choice is you go to an expert in that thing, and then if you don't, if there is no expert in that thing, the next thing is you go to, what are the themes in that movie or book, and is there an expert in that thing? You know, because then it's like they'll be able to say all the meaty stuff, and the only thing that they have to do is actually watch this person's movie, because they actually already have all the background. They would need to like interpret it. Um, so that's that's usually the second level I go to. Is like you know they may not be you know some of the people in the folk horror movie they're not experts in folk horror, but they're experts in like Southern Gothic or they're experts in some of the topics we spoke about. You know, jumping backwards just the folk horror again, but did you? find yourself trying to direct the talking points that they were going to say as far as you had, you knew what you wanted to communicate about mm -hmm. certain ideas, but you can't give them scripts. Only at the end. Yeah. So I would say for most of it, no. For most of it, I'm just going with whatever they say. But then as it got to the very end and I realized I needed glue, it's like I need something to transition from this to this. I really need someone to just talk about water in La Llorona. <laughs> and, you know, so I contacted Abraham uh, Castillo Flores, and I was just like, can you just say something about how water is important in the movie? <laughs> La Llorona. And he was like, yes, okay, no problem, you know? And uh, so there are a few things like that in the movie where I'm just like, I need somebody to say something. Um, and it was like, I didn't script it for them or anything, but it was still like, I need this thing, it needs to be about... 20 seconds long or whatever, you know, and they would just try to think of something they could say that would match it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, one of the books that, that you didn't do, and I don't know what your plans are for it, but that became the podcast was A Song from the Heart, Beats the Devil Every Time, mm -hmm. and I love this show so much, and I told you this earlier today, like, uh, it's one of my favorite things that you've done. Can you talk to me about what that project was meant to be and what your plans for the future are with it? Yeah, so I mean, originally I wanted to do kind of like, after we did the Kid Power book and it was kind of like a hodgepodge and, you know, but pe and people kept saying like, well, you didn't cover this movie, you didn't cover that movie, like it wasn't what they wanted or expected, you know? So then I was like, okay, I want to do a bigger movie about kids, or a bigger book about kids' movies and TV shows, but I really want it to be focused on the stuff that's interesting about them to me, you know? So it's like their relationship to the counterculture and the way that, you know, a lot of like... Uh, 60s underground artists and stuff like that ended up getting jobs on kids shows in the 70s and how those uh, aesthetics and concern environmental concerns like gender issues civil rights issues all these things would make their way into uh, Saturday morning cartoons and stuff you know and so I wanted to do this and I wanted to cover a lot of like specific case studies of like public access shows and things that hadn't been documented properly and a lot of like I was very interested in the, the ephemera you know so like the public access stuff the like educational classroom film things like things that you know Saturday morning cartoons are fairly well documented there are a lot of books about Saturday morning cartoons but um, there definitely weren't a lot of books about classroom films that weren't just academic books, you know, like there was nothing that had a lot of like pictures and the kind of way I like to do books. And so I just, yeah, I wanted to do something that was like really epic. Um, and I started sort of collecting materials for it, writing stuff for it, doing interviews for it. And I just realized it was just going to take forever and ever and ever to do this, and I needed to feel like I was accomplishing something, so I decided to turn it into like a podcast instead, because I thought, well, I can always do it as a book later still, you know, but this way I can feel some sense of accomplishment, or I can feel like there's some movement to it if I like make an episode that's basically like a chapter that's made into a podcast episode. And so the first one I did was The Devil and Daniel Mouse, because that's what the book and the podcast or whatever gets its name from. Um, you know, but I also have a whole, I ha I've only done two episodes so far, but I have like tons of interviews banked and stuff that I haven't had time to edit, you know. But I have the, you know, the second episode about Cypher in the Snow, 
um, which is a Mormon classroom film. Uh, yeah, I was kind of like, how am I going to beat this? Because it ended up getting really emotional and really, uh, like, I just love that episode. I think it's one of the best things you've done in, in the medium. I think it's, I think it's great. I think, it's a, I think anyone who wouldn't like it is a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but yeah, so it was, it was a fluke where it was like, I actually don't want to even give it away, okay. right? Because it has surprises yeah, in it, right? Spoiler. Um, but yeah, it was like the woman that I interviewed for it, who was the writer of Cypher in the Snow, uh, or the screenwriter of it, um, I tracked her down and it ended up being a journey. It was like a personal journey for me interviewing her. So, But you yeah. can hear the emotion and curiosity in your voice, because I feel like a lot of the work you do, I mean, you don't, because you're not like a character in, I mean, you know, in, in the documentary in that way, like it's... The, the questions you're asking, I mean, you can hear the passion and curiosity in those two episodes, and that's why I feel like if you do put the other interviews together into a show, I think it's a really valuable thing to, to have out there. Thank you. I mean, it was just important to me more to, to have these histories documented in some way with the actual people who made the show, like, as opposed to just, like, me being a critic talking about them or something. Like, I wanted to, like, get the people on record as much as I could. There's one coming up with a guy named Ronald uh, Flirtha, and he did um, one of my favorite classrooms films called All My Tomorrows, which is about a girl who overdoses on drugs at a party, and the whole film is in slow motion uh, as she like goes into a coma. So she's, she's like brain dead and in a coma, and her family coming to visit her, and she's just, you know, she, this is it. She's like stuck to this bed for life, you know? And it's just so haunting and creepy. And, uh, you know, so interviewing that guy, it was just hard to find information about his films at all. And so it was, it was, uh, I just felt like it was really important to, like, get him on record talking about the experience of making those films and what it was like making films for that market at that time and how you sold them and who, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, I, I hope that you get a, I know that you're about to go on a book tour and, uh, very busy schedule with these other upcoming books, but I hope that you can put more of these podcasts together when you have the time. Yes, me too. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the screenings that we're going to have this, you know, this festival with the restorations from Severin? I mean, you know, that, that, that uh, you have the book launch on Sunday, and then you have a series of films. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit, what people can see? Yeah, sure. So the book launch is on Sunday at 4 o'clock, I think it's up. And we are launching the book with the 4K restoration of Identikit, uh, which is a completely bonkers Liz Taylor film uh, based on a novel by Muriel Spark. And yeah, I don't want to actually say too much about that movie because it has it also has many surprises, but she is... I mean, if you've ever seen her in, like, Boom or Secret Ceremony, she's, like, even crazier in this film. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's... I'm really happy about that because it's, like, she has this amazing dress in the film, and so when we were making merch for the box set, obviously I was like, I want to make the dress, and we're like, that's really unrealistic. So, uh, so we decided to make a scarf instead because there is a scarf that plays a role in the film, and so we ended up making the scarf, but that has the pattern from the top of her dress, which is the really iconic pattern. And, um, yeah, so, you know, again, David, like, let me... Make this. Congrats from the lid here. Gazina just has that kind of personality. <laughs> but, but yeah, but so so. Yeah, so it's. I'm just very happy with it, it's, and so we're making, you know, making this scarf, which is like a nuts idea in itself. And um, and then the next day, the uh, things sh uh, shift over to the Cinematheque Quebecoise, and they're going to be playing uh, Severin's restoration of Il Demonio that was made for the Folk Horror Box Set, which to me, it's one of my favorite movies of all the things in the Folk Horror Box Set. It's a film uh, with Dahlia Lavi that some people might remember her from The Whip and the Body, the Baba film. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it's this beautiful black and white film. Um, and then I think the same night is I Like Bats, which is 
<coughs> the silliest of all the movies. It's, a, it's like a Polish vampire film from from the 80s. And then we have um, Footprints, you know, the Luigi Bizzoni Jalo film with Florinda Balkan, uh, which I think is a pretty beloved film that for whatever reason had just not come out on Blu-ray here. So we got it, and <laughs> so we're very happy about that. Um, and then In My Skin, because the Cinematheque also wanted to play something from their own archive. So they have a 35 millimeter print of Marina Devan's In My Skin, um, which was a really important uh, movie for me in the book. Like, I, I really love that film. And uh, yeah, so so we'll be doing Fab Press. Rick Trembles will be manning the table at all of those screenings with Fab Press books. So, yeah. Well, my, my podcast usually goes about four more hours, but I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, covered. Other than that, we uh, should cover. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me. Yes, thank you guys for staying. <laughs>